All right. We've probably staved off serious work just about as long as we can, unless someone insists. No. Okay. Well, today's thing is sort of a return to a more uh, orthodox educational kind of mode, hopefully not to such a degree that it's boring. Uh, but um, the agenda is to talk about uh, hermeticism and alchemy, and the way in which this tradition, which is counterintuitive and uh, heterodox, if not heretical, from the point of view of Christianity, and uh, you know what it can mean for the present, what it means for the psychedelic experience, what it means for the notion of uh, the end of history, and how the loss of this point of view has probably done us uh, a certain amount of damage. The great tension in the Middle Ages was between uh, the late Middle Ages was between the um, magical schema, the magical view of human beings, and the um, Christian view. And the Christian view is very strongly marked by the idea that uh, of man's fall, that we screwed up early on, and somehow then, by virtue of that, we're forced into a secondary position in the cosmic drama. We are doing penance as we speak. The world is a veil of tears. The lot of human beings is to till hard land. And, uh, you know, we are cursed unto the 19th generation or something like that uh, by the fall of our first parents. Uh, and we can be redeemed, this is I'm giving you the Christian rap, we can be redeemed through Christ, but we don't deserve it. It is, if you are saved, it is because there is a kind of um, a hand extended to you from a merciful God who is willing to overlook your wormy nature and draw you up in spite of yourself. And this is deep in us, no matter how, uh, you know, whether you're, you may not think you've bought in because you're black or because you're Chinese or something, but it's just in the air we breathe. It's what Western civilization makes you think whether you want to think it or not, you know, even if you don't come out of these traditions, uh, for us, the concept of that you've got to pay your dues. Human beings are co-partners with deity in the project of being. This is the basis of all magic. You see, in a Christian context, magic is heresy because it implies that that uh, man can command God to act. In other words, that in some strange way, the magician compels nature to behave as the magician desires. Uh, in Hermeticism, it isn't so much put in terms of compel, but the idea is that, that uh, Humanity, human beings, men and women of great spiritual accomplishment are co-partners in the project of being. And that God, as it were, stepped off the stage of creation with it only 90% completed. And the rest is left in the hands of his brother, the Hermetica actually refers to humanity as the brother of God. So it's a completely different attitude toward being human. It's an empowering attitude. With power comes the potential to abuse power because you're no longer a worm 
You remember that image in Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, where he says you're, you're, you're like a worm suspended over an abyss, held there only by the, um, the, the love of a merciful God, implying that if he weren't a merciful God, he'd just let go of your thread and you'd go down the tubes. Uh, in the hermetic magical view, human beings are not tainted by original sin. And no, no ideology is without the potential of abuse. Uh, the hermetic attitude in the Renaissance was summed up in a single aphorism by the great uh, Renaissance Platonist Marcello Ficino. And what he said was, and I have to, you know, I, I, there's no sexism in all of this. You just have to realize these guys were primitive types and they hadn't confronted uh, the, poli the political issues we've confronted. So when they say man, they mean humanity. The Renaissance magical attitude is summed up in Ficino's aphorism, man is the measure of all things. And this is, uh, this is a double-edged sword because in a single affirmation you cast off the guilt trip. You cast off the view of ourselves as a flawed creature. But when you say man is the measure of all things, I mean, you could be the chairman of the board of Louisiana Pacific or Dow Chemical. I mean, this is approximately their attitude. In other words, it ain't rainforests, it's not the life of the earth, it's none of that malarkey. We are to be the measure of all things. So the, it has to be tempered. Uh, we'll probably end up talking a bit here about what is about the pathological expression of the hermetic position, which is called Faustianism. And Faustianism is where you have unbridled ego, unbridled faith in the intellect so that you, uh, you proceed forward without self-doubt. If you haven't read Faust recently, uh, it's a surprising read. First of all, you know, it's very funny. It's hilarious. It's funnier than any of Shakespeare's plays, I think. And... Uh, the way it ends is in the guy dedicates himself to uh, land reclamation and the draining of swamps to build low-cost housing for poor people. I mean, people don't know this. They, they're caught up in the images of the center of the story where, you know, magical power is running rampant. But Faust's final conclusion is that he should do some good work for the least of society and give up these uh, Promethean and Titanic dreams of, uh, of the mastery of power. Well, uh, a little bit of history about this hermetic ideal. It's an interesting story in the light of our discussion of time yesterday. Western civilization, in a way, can be thought of as an accumulated series of misunderstandings. And uh, one of the most severe of these misunderstandings has to do with this whole business of Hermeticism. The Renaissance really believed that Hermes Trismegistus was uh, a, a great teacher of antiquity who preceded Moses who was in time older than Moses. And uh, they, they had what they called um, the Prisci Theologica, the three theologians. And they were Hermes Trismegistus, Moses, and Orpheus in that order. And uh, the reason that, that I say Western civilization is built on a series of misunderstandings is because they got it all wrong about Hermes Trismegistus. And there was great 
uh, great uh, confusion and unhappiness in the uh, in the uh, 16th century when Marie Cassabon, who was an early philologist, attacked the dating of the Hermetic corpus and argued correctly that this could not possibly have been written in a period preceding Moses, that in fact this was post-Christian, written no, er no earlier than the first century A.D. This is the equivalent of us finding out that, uh, you know, George Washington was alive in Greenwich Village in the 1930s or something. I mean, it was a completely mind-bending realignment of how people thought the history of the world had unfolded because they had up to that time thought that um, when you studied Hermes Trismegistus, you were reading the oldest philosopher in human history. Actually, it's very late. And in a way, this is what destroyed the magical uh, alternative. The, the advent of modern philology showed that these so-called ancient texts were not ancient at all. They were late Roman. They were Hellenistic. And uh, so strongly uh, was imprinted in the Western mind uh, the, what's called, and we've talked about it here this weekend, what's called the nostalgia for paradise. In other words, the belief that the older it is, the better it is. And uh, Guillaume Battista Vico in La Ciencia Nuova laid the basis for this kind of thinking. It's called classicism in the Renaissance context. So once they found out that the Hermetic Corpus had been written in, in late Roman times, it was like it was finished. And, and science was able to use the confusion in the magical community at that point to force its own agenda very strongly. And there, were num there have been numerous episodes of misplaced dating like this that have contributed to the confusion around the history of magic. For example, and I hope this doesn't bring somebody rising out of their chair in an air-clawing rave, but um, <laughs> Rosicrucianism rests on a whole bunch of phony dates because they want to tell you that, that uh, somebody named Christian Rosencrantz wrote a book called The Chemical Wedding and uh, sealed it up in a time capsule in the, in the uh, uh, 12th century and that it was then uh, dug up in the uh, 15th, 15th? 16th, dug up in the 16th century, but actually all these Rosicrucian documents were ponied up by people in the 16th century who had a very complicated political agenda, which we will probably discuss as part of this, uh, this weekend. Uh, hermetic philosophy is based on what is called the Hermetic Corpus. This is a group of books uh, uh, the most important of which is called the Asclepius. And these books, most of them, were completely lost during the Middle Ages. Uh, at the fall of the Roman Empire, copies of these Hermetic manuscripts were systematically destroyed by enthusiastic Christian barbarians. And uh, uh, the, her the hermetic manuscripts were scattered and they only survived then in monasteries in Syria and places like that. Well then in the Renaissance, uh, the Council of Florence under the patronage of, of uh, the Borgias and people like that, uh, they became very, there was this great interest suddenly in antiquities because these Roman statuary and stuff was coming out of the ground. So the Council of Florence 
commissioned a character named Gemistasis Pletho to go to Syria and bring back these manuscripts. And they established a translation uh, commission. And they had, in manuscript, the, ma the, the works of Plato, the works of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, a whole bunch of ancient literature. And to show you what the psychology of the Renaissance was, here they had Plato, which they hadn't been able to read for a thousand years, sitting there waiting for translation. And uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Cosimo de' Medici said to Marcello Ficino, Plato can wait. Translate the Hermetic Corpus first. And so it was done. If you're interested in, in Renaissance Hermeticism, you can't do better than read uh, Dame Frances Yates' book, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. Well, I want to read you some of this stuff because uh, it's very interesting and it has a, uh, a modernity that is astonishing. It's also very psychedelic. Um, here's a little passage on... Uh, on uh, the imagination. I'm reading from Book 9 of the Corpus Hermeticum in the Scott translation. This is a four-volume set. I only brought the text and translation volume. But um, if you read Greek, it's all here. If you don't, it's all here in English. Uh, but this will just give you a, a feeling for the approach. If then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal. Then you will apprehend God. Think that for you too nothing is impossible. Deem that you too are immortal and that you are able to grasp all things in your thought, to know every craft and every science. Find your home in the haunts of every living creature. Make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths. Bring together in yourself all opposites of quality, heat and cold, dryness and fluidity. Think that you are everywhere at once, on land, at sea, in heaven, Think that you are not yet begotten, that you are in the womb, that you are young, that you are old, that you have died, that you are in the world beyond the grave. Grasp in your thought all this at once, all times and places, all substances and qualities and magnitudes together. Then you can apprehend God. But if you shut up your soul in your body and abase yourself and say, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am afraid of earth and sea. I cannot mount to heaven. I know not what I was, nor what I shall be. Then what have you to do with God? Your thought can grasp in good if you cleave to the body and are evil. Interesting. Very different from the humble yourself, uh, hard labor, spun wool and watery beer approach of medieval uh, Christianity. Um, here's an amazing passage. Uh, you know, people like to think people thought the world was flat until uh, the Renaissance. Uh, this is a, an incredible psychedelic image of outer space that is second century A.D., would that it were possible for you to grow wings and soar into the air. Poised between earth and heaven, you might see the solid earth, the fluid sea and the streaming rivers, the wandering air, the penetrating fire, the courses of the stars, and the swiftness of the movement with which heaven encompasses all. What happiness were that, my son, to see all these borne along with one impulse, and to behold him who is unmoved, moving in all that moves, and him who is hidden, made manifest through his works. And it goes on and on. It's very readable. 
It's very literary. It's highly poetic. It's a celebration of nature. The notion of sin is completely absent. And it rings with a kind of confidence, a kind of joy that uh, was completely running counter to the brimstone and damnation point of view of Christianity. Here's a, uh, a, a uh, to me, a, a psychedelic passage. But he who presents all things to us through our senses and thereby manifests himself through all things and in all things and especially to those to whom he wills to manifest himself Begin then, my son, Tot, with a prayer to the Lord and Father, who alone is good. Pray that you may find favor with him, and that one ray of him, if only one, may flash into your mind, so that you may have power to grasp in thought that mighty being. For thought alone can see that which is hidden, inasmuch as thought itself is hidden from sight. And if even the thought which is within you is hidden from your sight, how can he, being in himself, be manifest to you through your bodily eyes? But if you have power to see with the eyes of the mind, then, my son, he will manifest himself to you. For the Lord manifests himself ungrudgingly through all the universe, and you can behold God's image with your eyes and lay hold on it with your hands. If you wish to see him, think on the sun, think on the course of the moon, Think on the order of the stars. Who is it that maintains that order? The sun is the greatest of the gods in heaven. To him as to their king and overlord and all the kings of heaven yield place. And yet this mighty God, greater than earth and sea, submits to having smaller stars circling above him. Who is it then, my son, that he always obeys with reverence and awe? Each of these stars, too, is confined by measured limits and has an appointed space to range in. Why do not all the stars in heaven run like and equal courses? Who is it that is assigned to each its place and marked out for each the extent of its course? And so forth. So it's, uh, it's a nature-oriented, celebratory. It glories in the exercise of the mind. It is not doctrinal. It is not uh, pietistic. It is magical, psychedelic, expansive. And I'm not implying that they used psychedelic substances. The evidence for that is incredibly murky and hard to get at. And probably they didn't. I mean, one of the real tragedies of Western history is that Western Europe is so poor in psychoactive plants. I mean, had, had uh, Western Europe stayed in touch with the mystery religions of ancient Greece, Christianity would never have been able to force its agenda to the degree that it did. I think you can make an argument that... Uh, there were psychedelic mysteries in Europe probably up until the time of the fall of Eleusis. Uh, Hermeticism is only one heterodox strain among many that were in existence in Europe in the late Roman period and that then partially survived into the Dark Ages. I mean, you have uh, Neoplatonism, which is... Uh, a group of philosophers in the in the third and fourth century, who uh, Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus, and that crowd, and they took Plato, the late Plato, and contorted that into uh, a mystical doctrine of uh, emanation. They were what are called emanationists. What this means is you start with it's either called the one or the unnameable or Brahman Atman or something like that. And then you have a series of declensions into more and more material and more and more multiplistic expressions of being. 
these Neoplatonists were emanationists and their theories about how the universe is constructed have become sort of the unconscious basis of all later magical speculation. Uh, it, they are the people who brought the angels into the picture so, so intensely because they were trying to create a descending hierarchy of being from the most high down to the most low. And angels, once set in place, uh, became a real problem for Christianity because they are um, not very easy to distinguish from the old stellar demons of, the, of paganism. Paganism was largely the belief that uh, the power of the stars could be drawn down to earth through a series, through sympathetic magic, really, uh, by setting up resonances in a ritual situation, you could draw the power of the stars down into your projects and your intentions. And uh, the late Middle Ages was a period of uh, intensely working out all the associations between uh, minerals, colors, perfumes, plants, musical uh, notes and uh, uh, you know styles, so that you could then bring together all these things for purposes of magical evocation. <laughs> And if any of you are interested in this, the, the book to read, which will point you toward many other interesting books, is a, a wonderful book called Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Ficino to Campanella. Some of you may remember Campanella. Hell of a fighter. Anyway. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> And uh, in the Renaissance, you know, over a period of about three generations, uh, this became a real problem because what starts out as angel magic ends up as out-and-out -out demonic conjuration, something which I've noticed my 14-year-old son has an incredibly unhealthy interest in, uh, which I did as well at his age. I hope it's not the family curse. Uh, <laughs> coming back. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the dating error. It was Lactantius, uh, who was one of the fathers of the early church, one of, of the patristic writers. That's that generation of theologians uh, that followed Christ, who canonized the Christian religion. And he placed... Uh, he placed Hermes Trismegistus as older than Moses, older than Pythagoras, older than Plato. And, uh, uh, and then it wasn't until uh, Marie Cassabon corrected that problem. See, we forget how the, the really transformative uh, breakthrough that was represented for Western Europe by the recovery of all of this ancient literature. It had been completely lost. Uh, and also a, a misimpression that probably needs correcting is I think most people who are not schooled in Western history think that the further back in time, the more quote unquote superstitious people were. This isn't actually the case. It isn't the case of the further back in time you go, the more belief in demons, magical conjuration, and stuff like that you get. Uh, the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries in Europe were periods of remarkable piety and intellectual cohesion. Of course, it was also some kind of a fascist nightmare. That's how they achieved it. They had stamped out paganism. They had pushed heresy and heterodox thinking to the very distant frontiers of the empire, uh, of the, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. 
and uh, uh, people were not superstitious and people were not obsessed with horoscopes and conjuration and this sort of thing. Where that all began was, uh, well, or where it reached its culmination is in the 16th century. The 16th century, the 1500s, it was the most magical obsessed century in the last 10. And alchemy and uh, conjuration and talismanic magic and uh, sympathetic magic, all of these things flourished really uh, not as a um, throwback, but as a kind of prelude to modern science. Modern science is an incredibly demonic enterprise. And we will see, as we discuss this stuff, that in an in curious and little, rarely discussed way, the program, uh, the agenda of, of magical dissidents in Europe have been entirely achieved by the forces of what we call modernity. It's simply that it has been done in an entirely secular metaphor. I mean, if you take even the, the trivial belief about alchemists, that they were concerned with changing lead into gold, of course, that isn't what it was about, but there were plenty of con artists running around on the periphery of these deeper scenes who were claiming they could change lead into gold. Well, in the 20th century, we routinely change lead to gold. You do it with neutron bombardment in particle accelerators. And of course, it costs far more to do it than the worth of the gold that you get out. But that really wasn't the point, was it? It was to prove that it could be done. Uh, the dreams of creating the homunculus uh, are dreams that dovetail directly into the aspirations of modern biology, genetics, so forth and so on. Uh, the, the great chain of being of Aristotle is animated, given a dimension of motion, and lo and behold, it becomes the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. Uh, the uh, Mersiliad talks about this, about how all the alchemical dreams of the 15th and 16th century have been brought to fruition in the 20th century. But again, in the absence of magical rhetoric, but certainly in a spirit of magical and Faustian recklessness, for sure. I mean, this is scientists, you know, they claim such a devotion to truth that decency must never stand in the way because they serve a higher God than human values. They serve uh, the golem of the truth in some weird way that makes the truth okay even if it kills you. I studied philosophy from Paul Feyerabend and he used to say at the beginning of his Epistemology 101 course, I will teach you to recognize the truth and I will teach you to ask the question, what's so great about it? <laughs> you know, I mean, so now you've got the truth, so what's so great about it? Uh, it was 1460 when these manuscripts were brought to Florence. Those of you with photographic memories can see the time wave signature as it turns over and heads through the floor. Uh, and uh, the um, Cosimo de Medici immediately ordered Ficino to abandon his work on, Pletho, on uh, Plato. And, uh, and the Pymander, which was one of these uh, uh, books, which had been, it was the only one which existed in Europe, uh, even in partial form during the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, Cosimo died in, in 1464, but the translation project uh, went forward and uh, just so you understand, the, the tree, the developmental process in Western magic goes basically, all goes back to this Florentine translation project. And from there, people who were well-placed got a hold of this stuff. 
the most important person probably being uh, uh, a person, certainly an unsung hero in the development of Western thought, Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim. And Trithemius uh, wrote a book, it was really a manuscript, it was never printed as a book in his lifetime, but later, called the Stenographica. And in it, he put forth many of these magical doctrines and also encryption methods for code making and breaking so that this stuff could be circulated under the eyes of the clergy without uh, causing a problem. And then the, the development of Western magic splits into two strains. Uh, the Bruno strain, Giordano Bruno, I understand he's running for president of the United States this year. <laughs> Giordano Bruno and his school, he was a Franciscan monk who ended up being burned at the stake. His sin for which he was burned at the stake was he was sitting on a rooftop of one of these Italian city-states one evening, presumably smoking some pretty decent boo that they brought in from North Africa. And uh, he was looking at the stars and he, it occurred to him, these things are sun. These little points of light are like the sun. Jesus Christ! And in a single moment, the universe became infinite. And he said, if these are suns, and he just, you know, his mind was boggled, literally. I mean, can you imagine inside the medieval worldview where they have these concentric shells of angels and demons and the, all this? Suddenly, this guy gets it in a single moment and he sees that the universe is infinite and he begins to say so and this is against Aristotle and uh, the church just goes nuts and they drive him out of Italy and he has a whole bunch of adventures in England and other places eventually he makes the mistake of coming back to a place in northern Italy where he's betrayed by his patron and he is uh, He's burned at the stake for a point of view which all of us take quite for granted. The other uh, strain of magic coming down from Trithemius is the D strain. And it is a bit more accessible to people like ourselves because John D was an Englishman and he wrote in English. And so you don't have to conquer uh, 16th century Italian or, uh, or late Latin in order to read him, although he wrote a lot in Latin as well. Dee is a very interesting character worth spending some time on because Dee is the last person to be able to unify into one worldview uh, science and mathematics and magic and astrology uh, all together. So he is the greatest magician of his age and the greatest scientist of his age. He designed the navigation instruments that Sir Francis Drake used to go around uh, the, uh, the Cape Horn and sail up the coast of California. He, did, he was a, an intelligence operative serving Queen Elizabeth uh, on the European continent. He could cast the best horoscope in Europe and that was his entree into these various royal families of these various capital cities of Europe. And then he was, you know, making maps of, of battlements and of the deployment of war facilities and shipbuilding capacity and stuff like that and sending it all back to Elizabeth uh, in these codes that he had learned from Trithemius, not personally, but from the Stenographica. And D, uh, a very strange incident happened, which was uh, on a cold day in April 
at his house in Mortlake, which is on the outskirts of London. Now it's completely surrounded by modern London. Uh, I should say he had he had the largest library in England. He had six thousand books. Sir Philip Sidney and the Queen would occasionally call upon him to shoot the bull, and uh, he he was a very learned man. So one day in April of 1582, he's working at his desk at his room in Mortlake, and he goes outside. He's, there's some disturbance in the garden, and he goes outside, and his story, and we have only his story, is that an angel descended in a ball of light and gave him an object which is uh, to this day on exhibit in the British Museum. Uh, if you ever have a chance, it's worth hunting it down. It's in the Renaissance Hall. And it's, uh, it's a piece of black polished obsidian uh, roughly about this big and about that thick and very highly polished. It, he called it the show stone, S-H-E-W. And it, what the deal was, was you could look into the show stone if you had the right talent, and you, it was a magical theater. There were gods and demons and uh, female spirits and all kinds of things swirling around this thing. Well, for the next uh, many years... The showstone was the major guiding force on Dee's life. And a guy came to him named Edward Kelly. And Edward Kelly, uh, legend has it that he had no ears, which in England at that time meant that you had committed some infraction in the province and they had removed your ears. It was the mark of a con artist. Uh, was, so you couldn't fool anybody else. They took your ears off. So then if you met somebody with no ears and a big scheme, you knew to keep your wallet in your pocket. So, so this guy Kelly had an immense facility with this showstone. I mean, he could just sit down with it, and it is one of the most puzzling and undiscussed episodes in the evolution of Western thought. The straight people just say, whoa, this is a bunch of crap, you know, this guy, Kelly. First of all, Dee was married to a much younger woman named Anne Dee, and at one point in the ten years or so that Dee and Kelly were together, the angels of the showstone uh, gave very explicit instructions that so this guy was a sharpie for sure <laughs> however it's it, it's very puzzling because if he was if he was a con artist he must have been a con artist of immense uh, cleverness because often the way the D angels would work is they would deliver very very long messages in Latin backwards and Kelly Kelly would just dictate this stuff at a very rapid speed and D would write it down and then they would put away the show stone and then they would very laboriously rewrite this stuff from back to front and then there were these long coherent harangues about what they should be doing about which courtly figures they should uh, support with money and who should be introduced to who. It was very political, you know. Well, what kind of a polymathic talent was Edward Kelly that he could invert whole pages of Latin and reel it off and then have it be reconstructed and make sense? Also, there are, you see, this. we know about this because Dee kept a diary over the years that this was all going on. It's one of the most astonishing books in all of English literature. And until the last 10 years, the 1658 edition was the only edition ever published. Uh, it's called A True and Faithful Relation, 
or in full a true and faithful relation of what passed for many years between Dr. D and some spirits with the annotation by Marie Casabon, the guy who did the correct dating on the Hermetica. Uh, and it, it's very interesting reading. It's, a, as I say, one of the most puzzling instant, uh, incidents in the whole history of science. What D was doing was eventually he came to rest at the court of Rudolf II, Rudolf I of, of Bohemia, who ruled from Prague. Now, you have to understand, is that a hand up? Yeah. yeah. Is there evidence of, uh, of drug use? Like Not strong enough to, to uh, warrant any getting thrilled about it. Uh, the great awareness of drug use came slightly later, uh, and strangely enough, uh, the drug was opium. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's interesting, the history of opium. You know, we think of, of uh, opium and its derivatives, uh, junk and heroin, as just the lowest, well, maybe crack is now the lowest of the low, but anyway, it's a real scuzzball drug, according to most people's opinion. But did you know that no, they had been using opium for 3,000 years before anybody noticed that it was an addicting drug. It was not ever noted that opium was addicting until 1611 when John Playfair, a very famous English physician, wrote a book in which he commented on opium and said, uh, once one has begun the habit of opium, it must be maintained unto death. So. Uh, in the in the 30 years after D, there was a great hermeticist and alchemical thinker named Paracelsus, who arose on the European continent. Paracelsus is an interesting guy. He's essentially the inventor of drugs because he was the first person to extract herbs and to get this notion of the essence that there's that if you have a medicinal plant then there's something in there which you want to get out and concentrate he called his school of of uh, alchemy iatrochemistry the doctor's chemistry and he invented pills of the ordinary sort and uh, and uh, he said, I have made a great discovery. The center of my alchemical opus rests with the magic of laudanum, which was, of course, gum opium. Uh, there, there was a craze in the late 15th century among alchemists for opium. The, the alchemist von Helmuth, uh, he, he signed some of his alchemical tracts Dr. Opiatus. He, he was uh, the first croaker. <laughs> Somebody had a question? Yeah. You talked about the fall of Eleusis. How does the life go out when it goes out? The fall of Eleusis. Well, as you all probably know, Eleusis was a cult site near Athens uh, on a plain. There's now a big lumber yard uh, there, the last time I was there. But anyway, uh, it was this plain, a very fertile plain outside of ancient Athens, and uh, they celebrated the greatest of the Greek mysteries there. They celebrated, uh, it was a, a biennial, or I mean a twice yearly festival. In the spring, they would celebrate uh, uh, the lesser mystery. And this seemed to be a fairly local uh, get-together of some sort and probably a planting festival. But every September for 2,000 years, people from all over the Greco-Roman world would come for the festival at Eleusis. And the rule was, it, first of all, it was open to everyone. Men, women, free man, slave, 
everyone could attend. The rule was you could only attend once in your life. And so you had one shot at whatever this thing was, and you were sworn to silence. And literally, everyone who was anyone went to Eleusis to experience the mysteries. I mean, Herodotus, Thucydides, Plato, Aeschylus, Euripides, um, everybody. Uh, people would make journeys of thousands of miles. It was the wellspring of Greek spirituality. The problem is we can't, we don't know with certainty what the excitement was all about. I mean, we know that there was an inner cult area called the Telesterion and that people would, that something was drunk and that something was seen. And in the 19th century, they just went nuts on this subject. I talk about it in my book. And they finally, all these uh, constipated Victorian classicists decided that the mystery of Eleusis must be a representation of uh, the female genitals illuminated at the height of this ceremony by a laser light show of some sort. And so, you know, it was just absurd. I mean, it was a, a complete distillation of the Victorian mind being project. I mean, you'd like to believe that the roots of Western civilization are deeper than a peep show, but <laughs> hey, who knows? Uh, there was a very interesting incident in, it's called uh, the Scandal of 415, which is that in 415 BC, a wealthy Athenian noble named Alcibiades uh, was busted for the charge was possessing the Eleusinian mystery and distributing it to guests at dinner. Well, this seems to make it fairly clear that this was not a clay representation of anybody's genitals. Uh, this was some kind of a dope of some sort. So then the scholars whip out their knives and, and all kinds of theories have been brought forward. Uh, some of you may know the, the um, scholar Robert Graves discusses this in The White Goddess. And his theory, which I think deserves to be more, more looked at than it has, his theory was that um, these recipes, if people drank something from a special cup called a kekekion, and uh, recipes supposedly exist for what they drank, and it's honey, barley, something else, and always water. And, uh, and uh, uh, Graves argued that you don't, that water is not something that you list as an ingredient of something you drink. Obviously, it has water in it. So he said the inclusion of water in this list is in order that there can be an augum do you know what an augum is? And you will when I tell you, because you've all seen them. An augum is when you make a list of things in such a way that the first letters spell out a word. You grok that? So the idea was that in Demotic Greek, the words for barley, honey, water, and this fourth ingredient that I can't remember, those four words can be arranged to spell out the word miko, which means mushroom. So Robert Graves was convinced that a psilocybin mushroom lay behind the Eleusinian mysteries. This is a pretty good, uh, this is uh, not entirely unreasonable. Now, a few years ago, there was a book called, written by uh, the great mushroom enthusiast and discoverer Gordon Wasson and the chemist who discovered LSD, Albert Hoffman, and the classicist uh, Ruck, 
the three of them, and Jonathan Ott, I think, was also in there, wrote a book called uh, Persephone's Quest. Not Persephone's Quest, that's a different book. The Road to Eleusis. Good, watch me. Uh, <clears throat> the Road to Eleusis. And they put forth there a new theory, which was that uh, on the plain of Eleusis they grew uh, barley. And, and uh, these people thought that there may have been a, a special strain of claviceps. Do you all know what claviceps is? Do you all know what ergot is? Ergot is a smut. A smut is a disgusting disease, a fungal disease of grain. Have you ever been in a cornfield and seen an ear of corn that looks like it's covered with some black, slimy, horrible stuff that's flowing out of it and all over it. It's absolutely disgusting. Although God, in California, I don't know if this is hit here yet, but in California for the past year, the hippest thing that you can be served at pretentious art openings and stuff like that is corn smut, which they spread on crackers. Mm -hmm. And it's just horrible. <laughs> and it's really expensive. I mean, it's more expensive than caviar, and it's just become a craze. And I wouldn't get near it. I mean, it's not only disgusting to look at, but the chemistry of it is so weird. God alone, I mean, hives would be the least of your problems. And anyway, so corn smut, and there are rye smuts, and there are wheat smuts. But interestingly, the, the rye smut, which is ergot, is an, uh, an organism called Claviceps paspali, uh, produces LSD-like alkaloids. And uh, the problem is that um, LSD, ergot-related alkaloids, are also uh, very, tend to cause convulsions, or they can cause convulsions. If any of you suffer from migraine headaches, now there are a lot of different drugs for migraine. But up until just four or five years ago, the drug of choice for migraine was called ET, ergonomine tartrate. Ergonomine tartrate, if you've got a kilo of it, you can settle down and make several million hits of LSD. Ergonomine tartrate is this very rigidly controlled underground substance that is produced legally only in certain sanctioned fields in northern Pakistan and it's produced for the world market of migraine sufferers and you get these little tiny blue pills I, I have migraines I used to take or got but I don't I've gotten it under control but anyway uh, it's the drug of choice for migraine because it constricts uh, the vessel the blood arteries going into the head. Anyway, uh, Wasson and Hoffman argued that what they were doing at Eleusis is that they were brewing an ergot beer. They were deliberately gathering barley that was infected with claviceps and they were uh, brewing an intoxicating beer. And people were having a hallucinogenic experience. Well now this is a great area for uh, the able-bodied among us to do research because it should be possible to collect uh, claviceps and maybe even to go to Eleusis and collect claviceps there and culture it out and see if you could make an ergot beer that would actually get you hallucinogenically stoned. I'm not sure what's going on. I. Uh, Ergot is a dangerous substance. Uh, I remember an anecdote once. Uh, many years ago, I knew these people who occasionally dealt illegal substances. And uh, one day, they, they were moving some E.T. to somebody. And uh, they asked this guy there if he would take this ounce of E.T. and deliver it to this certain address. And they, when they gave it to him, they said, now, this is E.T., you know, so just leave it alone. 
and he got out in the car and he looked, he opened up the baggie and it was this white powder and he said, you know, <laughs> these people can't fool me. So he honked up a little of it and then he went on his appointed rounds and, and the guy who was supposed to have the stuff delivered, um, he was sitting in his house and he heard this commotion on his front porch and opened the door to find this guy flopping around with his legs and feet in the air having uh, uh, convulsive seizures because of the E.T. he'd snorted up. It's just one more story about the dangers of white powder drugs, folks. Uh, anyway, uh, it's important for the argument because... Um, I don't see how they could have been serving several thousand people ergotized beer every September for 2,000 years and not had the Ellicinian Mysteries get a certain reputation for risk, you know, that people would have convulsions and conceivably even die of heart attacks. I mean, how could they get that many people loaded year in and year out and not get a bad rap on it? And then and I, t I talked to Albert Hoffman about this, and he didn't seem to feel that it was such a problem. He said that what you could do is uh, float hot oil on the surface of this beer, and you could draw off the convulsive alkaloids would have an affinity for the hot oil, and then you could just skim this oil off and discard it, and you would leave the hallucinogenic material in the beer. Well, I haven't tried this. Uh, like I say, it's for the able-bodied. But in any case, this was the last outpost in the West of, uh, of uh, psychedelic mystery. And eventually, those enthusiastic Christian barbarians appeared on the scene. In this case, it was Alaric the Visigoth, a great guy to take to an art museum. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they smashed it all to pieces. Alaric the Visigoth was kick-ass. People don't realize that these barbarian invasions of the late Roman Empire the Vandals took over a huge swath of North Africa. They didn't just stop at the bottom of the boot of Italy or on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. These guys just kept rolling. And huge parts of Africa were under the control of Visigoths and, and uh, Vandals. North Africa, Carthaginian coast of the Mediterranean. And that killed, that was the end of the Illicinian mysteries. Uh, but it shows how late this mystical psychedelic impulse uh, persisted in Western civilization. Uh, see, the thing that gave the Greeks their genius was that it was a mingling of a, of a northern mentality coming out of Thracia and places like that, meeting a t very old mystical uh, feminist culture that had its roots 10,000 years deep in Saharan Africa via Egypt and uh, Chattalhya Yuk in Turkey uh, because it was said even in classical times what is celebrated in secret at Eleusis is celebrated publicly at Knossos uh, in, in Mycenae you see the Mycenae uh, uh, in, in Minoan Crete. You see Minoan civilization was an archaic civilization. It preserved the goddess worship, the opium use. Uh, uh, all of these archaic styles were preserved in, in Minoan Crete for millennia after the rule on the coast of Asia Minor was kingship, bronze-tipped spears, city building, and that whole sweat socks mentality that built up there. Uh, what, and what finished those folks off was around 950 AD, uh, Mycenaean pirates eventually laid siege to these Minoan cities. And after centuries of slowly drifting deeper and deeper into opiated decadence, 
Minoan Crete fell, but all of the mysteries and the mysticism and the orgiastic rites and all of these archaic forms were then imported into Greece as mystery religions, as cult practices. Uh, one of the puzzles of Minoan religion is that they worshipped these things or they had a religious relationship to these things called uh, aniconic pillars, they're called. What they are are mushrooms, as far as I can tell. They built shrines, they worshipped columns, but these columns were slightly flared on the top. If any of you are interested in that, well, something that should be said. See, we have a distorted view of, of how culture developed and what classicism really meant because for the past, throughout the 18th and 19th century, European scholarship spent a huge amount of time it distorting and erasing the debt of Greek civilization to Africa. They, they basically screwed with the record because they just couldn't bring themselves to believe that all this wonderful architecture and proportion and mathematics, that it was little brown people who were responsible for this. And, and if you're interested in this, this book, there's a book by Burnell called Black Athena that is a really radical book. Have any of you read it? It had quite a... It was very controversial a couple of years ago. Great book. Yeah. Black Athena by Burnell. And it shows how, how Western culture misrepresented the debt of classicism to Africa. I mean, they could tolerate the idea of Egypt as long as you always made sure, you know, that these people were white as the driven snow. Well, it's a bunch of malarkey. I mean, it was, a, it was a thoroughgoing black culture. And everything was derivative of it right up until, I don't know, the Byzantine Empire or something. I mean, Plato freely acknowledged his debt to this stuff. It was just that it was unswallowable to late European culture. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they did a cover thing on it. I, I uh, didn't read it, Time, a few months ago. Yeah, what was it called? Our, Our African Roots or something? Yeah. And there are, it's not, it's no uh, shuck and jive. I mean, we think 19th century scholarship was so careful and so wonderful, and what it really was was an old boys club. I mean, they were fast and loose with this stuff. You know, I think when it's all sorted out, it all happened in Africa. I mean, language, religion, symbolic activity, theater, all of this stuff was in place in Africa from, say, 20,000 B.C. up until around 9,000 B.C. in the Saharan grasslands, which then, because of drying, uh, these people were forced into the Nile Valley and uh, into a different cultural style. But uh, the African cradle of civilization, I don't even regard that as a theory. Anybody who doesn't believe that is going to have to do some fast talking. And, you know, there's been this recent effort to say that uh, the Australian Aborigines broke off very, very early. But, um, you know, it's pretty specious, I think. You probably all know the theory of Eve and the fact that you can trace the maternal line through the episome of the mitochondria. So you can actually, it, it's actually now believed that every human being on earth is descended from one woman. And this woman lived in Africa less than 200,000 years ago. You know, it's really amazing. All other human lines have been quenched somewhere along the line. She was, her progeny were phenomenally successful. And uh, 
this, this is, I would say now, the strongest theory about this now is the Eve theory. When it was first propounded, it was thought to be screwball, but that's because the physical anthropologists didn't really understand how the molecular geneticists achieved this conclusion. Once it was explained to everybody, it's pretty clear, you know, that, that we are all descended from one single female human being, not that there weren't other human beings that she was embedded in as a society, but none of those lines of descent reach to the present. Uh, yeah. What do you say to the uh, well, it was decadent in the sense that it went into a kind of a deep freeze. The level of change in the last thousand years of Minoan civilization, the dating of ceramic and stuff like that is almost impossible because they were completely static. They were unchanging for a very, very long time in that late phase. And that's when these opium tallies were rising like crazy. Yeah. The Hermetica. They were beginning to uh, invent. In fact, the Casa Bones are considered to be the inventors of modern philology. Oh, is it? Interesting. I wonder if it was a soap job. Uh, yeah, modern philology, and the way you do it is by interlocking textual reference and studying locution styles. And it, it was a tremendous shock to the Renaissance when they realized that what they thought was 5,000 years old was less than a thousand, you know, or was about a thousand years old. And that's what really discredited that whole worldview, which is in a way silly, because who cares how old it is? The question is, how much sense does it make? But the Renaissance was so strongly imbued with this uh, belief that the ancient things were the better, that if something was shown to be not as old as previously thought, then it usually went on the discard pile. I think that we lost... Who were they? It was Cosimo de' Medici and that family and the Borgias. But you know, this family, there were, I think, 11 popes who bore the name Borgia in a hundred year period. So these people were very, very well connected. They were very wealthy. They had disposable income which was something new in the world. And, and they invented a whole bunch of things which God knows this city lives or dies by. I mean, like connoisseurship, patron of, patronage of the arts, and uh, uh, secular research projects. I mean, they were funding da Vinci's work on catapults and flying machines at the same time that they were keeping all these painters paid and uh, in mistresses and so forth. They were uh, organizing archaeological digs. People couldn't believe this stuff. I mean, we, we have assimilated all this, but they had forgotten the classical world. And then, and they lived, you know, they lived in places like Rome and Naples and Venice, but they had never dug and they'd just been quarrying the Colosseum and stuff like that. Well, then when they began bringing this stuff out of the ground, and then the platonic corpus and all this, they just went ape for classicism. So ape that, you know, now we're this year celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus's voyage, which in a sense can be seen as the cherry on the, on the top of the Renaissance mental explosion, uh, we are still living in a classical world. We still react against classicism. The buildings we live in, the clothing we wear, 
our notion of how gentlemen behave, our attitudes toward women largely, uh, our attitudes towards private wealth, uh, all of this is classicism. And it had been dead 1,200 years before these Italians latched onto it and dusted it off and set it up. And, you know, there had the modernism, in its broadest context, whatever that means, is the first movement to come along to be able to, in any way, challenge classicism. The, the subsets of cla the, the, the art movements and literary movements that preceded modernism were simply aspects of classicism. Romanticism, uh, mannerism, um, the Baroque, all of these are, are like facets of the classical object. It's only in modernism. And what modernism represents, in my humble opinion, is a kind of return to the archaic. Modernism deconstructs the clarity of the Western eye. If you have to date where modernism begins, it begins with Impressionism, which takes the clarity of the Western eye and begins to dissolve it, you know. And the linear, you know, the columns and lines, that's how narrative was until James Joyce and, uh, and Henry James and, and people like that showed that narrative could be broken up. Uh, modernism is a form of primitivism, strangely enough. Uh, the people who created modernism, people like Marcel Duchamp and Picasso and the Surrealists, they were tremendously influenced, in the case of Picasso, by African art, masks and sculpture, stuff that had never been seen in Paris in 1905 through 15, and everybody was tremendously excited by it. So modernism is part of this much larger phenomenon which I call the archaic revival. You know, the discovery of the unconscious through Freud and Jung, the deconstruction of the image, first the image seen through Impressionism, and then the image imagined is deconstructed through um, Surrealism and Dada, and then finally, you know, the concentration on the materials of art which you get in abstract expressionism, where it is about paint. It's no longer about paint in the service of, of, of uh, the visual pictorialism. It just, and then all the postmodern stuff, which is, of course, just sort of running naked, screaming through the street kind of aesthetic. Is, yeah. <laughs> No one ever knows the beats about the very, very thousand and see about what was happening in the media. Well, this thing, the only this one instance I mentioned, the scandal of 415 and this guy Alcibiades, and he was fined. He was fined and given a warning. Question, yeah. Um, yeah, the origin. Good question. Uh, see, what happened? I mean, it's very interesting. Some of you who are interested in Heidegger may know a wonderful essay by uh, Hans Jonas called The Gnostic Temperament. And what he's saying in there is that the... the uh, attitude, the psychology of the late Roman Empire, let's say Rome from AD 150 to 400 or so, was strikingly what we would call modern. That, that a, a profound kind of exhaustion entered into the Roman psychology uh, in that late phase, they became, you know, the de a good definition of decadence is it's sophistication without feeling, you know. 
and it's Camille Paglia's definition, by the way. Uh, and and the Roman Empire made the emperor a god. Well, imagine the cynicism that would pervade our society if you were under state order to light candles to George Bush. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're free to think of the man as a jackass, and it's not heresy. I mean, it may be bad taste, but, or, but it isn't heresy. And uh, the Roman Empire expanded so rapidly and took in so many different kinds of people. I mean, there were, you know, the, the Jews at the end of the Mediterranean, the Parthian Empire had been partially incorporated into the Roman Empire, uh, Egyptian mystery religions and uh, African folk religion, barbarian, Celtic, ideals were being imported in and it just it became uh, uh, the, and the state religion the religion of the emperor as God was uh, it was fairly tolerant uh, you had to burn a candle to Caesar but you could also burn a candle to Asarte and Thoth and Hermes and all these other people what got the Christians in trouble was they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, give Caesar his due even though it says to do this, you know, they kept claiming uh, that they were had some kind of political agenda. They kept expecting the return of a political figure. The Romans hated that because they didn't. If they saw it as a political force, well, in that situation, then after you see, you have to talk about early Christianity to get this stuff in context. Uh, people don't understand how shape our knowledge of the origins of Christianity are with good reason because the religion wants you to believe that it's all very cut and dried there are real mysteries surrounding the birth of Christianity uh, let me just r run through it a little bit um, we all know or most of us know if you're not completely secular uh, the Christmas story and it begins, and Caesar Augustus decreed that a census should be taken of all the world, and each was going to his village to register. Do you all know this story? And so this explains why a pregnant Galilean woman, nine months pregnant, is 110 miles away from her home village in Jerusalem. We're told that they are obeying the dictates of Caesar Augustus to participate in this census of the empire. And we're told that Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea at this time. There was no census ordered by Caesar Augustus. No record exists of this anywhere. And if this had happened, it would have been an enormous bureaucratic task involving hundreds of clerks and the coordination of data from all parts of the empire. It would have been a shtick of some sort. And there's nothing, nothing, only this reference in the whole story of Christ. Well, you know, weird. Okay, so then you move on. The assumption is that Christ was born in 6 BC uh, under the conjunction conjunctio maximus of Jupiter and Saturn. That places, the, if you believe the Gospels, that he was killed at age 33, that means the crucifixion must have been in 27. Well, uh, there is no reference to Christ outside the Gospels until AD 71. What was happening between 27 and 71? It's damn near 50 years. And the whole thing falls silent. And then uh, what we get in 71 in, um, I think the Roman, uh, it's, I guess it's in Suetonius. Suetonius, who was a Roman historian and contemporary, he says in a long rap about something else, he says, Jews have recently come to Rome and uh, caused public disturbances at the behest of their leader, Crispus. This is as close as we get. 
We don't even know if Crispus is Christ. We just accept that this must be so because Suetonius is telling us that Jews of a religious type have come to Rome and caused this agitation. Uh, uh, the, it, some people have even wanted to that, uh, that Christianity was invented in the late 60s and that, the, that there never was a person named Christ, that zealots who were preparing the uprising of 69 against the Roman Empire uh, created a mythical figure of a generation earlier and uh, uh, used this mythical figure as a symbol of their rebellion. It would be sort of as if we were to get into Joe Hill. You all know who Joe Hill is? The engine of socialism is a slipping back. Come on, all you workers, shovel sand on the track. Joe Hill was a martyr to, to social reform in this country. I believe he was shot by a firing squad in Utah in 1913. Well, we could reach back to Joe Hill and make him the founder of our movement and say what a great guy he was and collect stories about his life and, and it, we could use it to center ourselves and build a kind of social reform movement in the name of Joe Hill. Yeah. The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. He basically says something very much like this. Uh, I don't know about that. I just think it's very peculiar that we know so little about Christ when he had such a major role to play. I mean, take a guy like Manai. Manai, the founder of Manism, who was uh, born uh, in, uh, I think, around 320. Uh, God, we know everything about Manai. We have his tax returns. I kid you not. We have the guy's tax returns. And we know what he looked like. We know who his friends were. We know he had marital problems. A real person, you know. And yet his religion was stomped into oblivion. So there's something funny about all this. And of course, Christ is no ordinary person. Christ is the third person of the Trinity. God incarnate. This is a claim. This was an idea that had been around for a few hundred years. You, you all have heard of Dionysius, who most people tend to connect to Bacchus, the, the drunken late Roman god of wine. But the early Dionysius is a much, much weirder figure. The early Dionysius uh, is uh, an androgyne always in the company of women, a god of ecstatic frenzy. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion always claimed was, first of all, women were the, the major followers of Dionysius, and they would uh, intoxicate themselves in some way, and then, holding hands, dance through the countryside and, uh, and uh, rend their clothing and just carry on outrageously. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion claimed was that they became so frenzied that these women, who were called Manaeids, uh, ate their own children. This was the lie spread about the Dionysian religion. Well, the story of the birth of Dionysius is very interesting because his father was Zeus, the hidden higher all father, analogous to God the Father in Christianity, but his mother was Simila. And in some versions, Simila is a mortal woman, the daughter of King Cadmus of Thebes, but in other versions, she's herself some kind of a goddess. Anyway, she was one of these many affairs that Zeus had. He was always impregnating women and, and bearing children. And uh, in the eighth month of her pregnancy, she was struck by lightning and killed. And she was very dear to Zeus. And when he came upon her dead, he immediately performed a caesarean operation. 
and he cut open his thigh and he put the child into his own thigh and laced up the wound and the child was born out of the wound six weeks later. Now this may be grotesque and peculiar but notice that what we have here is something close to a virgin birth. It's, uh, it's born of the father is what we have and Dionysius was then called the twice born God because he was born once by caesarean section from his mother and born again six weeks later from the thigh of the father and it's thought that this Dionysian impulse in the hands of these uh, mystical Jews became then the doctrine of the immaculate conception and the whole notion of an immaculately conceived child. Christ is a type of Isaias. I mean, it's heresy to say so, but comparative religionists have been saying this for centuries. Uh, Dionysius was a religion of, of orgy and ecstasy, typical of this period in Greece. Another religious system that was sort of complementing the Hermetica and developing alongside it was um, Gnosticism. And, you know, I said a few minutes ago that the psychology of the late West Roman Empire was very modern. Gnosticism is a very, very modern impulse. It may not at first appear so because ancient Gnosticism is freighted with angels, demons, what we would call superstition. But if you strip away all that Baroque stuff, you come to a philosophy very similar to the philosophy that many of us have accepted really without thinking. We just call it modern attitudes. But the idea in Gnosticism is that you're on your own. You know? There, there ain't no free lunch. If, a God, if God did make the universe, he disappeared shortly afterwards and has no interest in you, your fate, your fears, your hope. Uh, we don't belong. Gnostics were profoundly phobic of the world. And uh, they uh, were either very ascetic cults or they were very uh, libertine like cults springing from the same idea which was that they did not belong in this universe they were from a different place and their whole concern was to escape they are the ones who decided that the earth is an iron prison uh, they didn't like to have children because they felt that to have a child is to trap light in matter the only, in many Gnostic sects, the only forms of sexual activity that they approved of were forms that were guaranteed to not lead to conception. So oral sex, anal sex, whatever. But never sex which could lead to conception because that would trap the light and that was an abomination. Needless to say, these sects died out in a hurry uh, because they were self-limiting. There were all kinds of religious impulses, yeah. Yes, he, he said that these zealots were using Amanita Muscaria as a sacrament and that Christ was a, was a, a symbol of the mushroom so that they could refer to the mushroom without directly referring to it so that only the believers would know. Uh, I, John Allegro's case is interesting but not entirely persuasive. Um, there needs to be more work in this area. There is something going on in the ancient Middle East about mushrooms. It's hard to reconstruct, first of all, because the climate itself has changed so much that there are no mushrooms. But uh, 
the, the evidence is pretty strong and getting stronger that, uh, that there was um, mushroom use. I reproduced in my book a picture of a mushroom object and I was hoping I had another one here, but I guess I left it back at the apartment. Uh, Man, uh, Mandianism, which is an old, old cult in that part of the world, forbids the use of mushrooms, which is puzzling since there are none, you know, and they don't forbid much, but they go way out of their way to forbid mushrooms. Uh, out of all this turmoil, I mean, it was very much like modern times. The whole Hellenistic world was awash in religious speculation. On every street corner, they were casting horoscopes and prescribing diets. And, you know, there were the, the temple prostitutes. So, so there was a whole uh, hedonic element uh, in sexuality. Orgy was a style in some religious organizations. And uh, out of all of this religious foment, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Chaldean oracularism, uh, Jewish syncretism, so forth and so on. Uh, and Christianity was in there, but it was just one in the crowd, but with sharpened elbows and a sense of organization, it was able to slowly worm its way into a position of dominance. The, the real Christians, whatever that means, probably were stamped out under the name of pagans. You see, what happened was the message of Christianity was that the end of the world was imminent. This is the other thing that they were into that has also reemerged in modern times, is the eminence of the end of the world. And um, so for about 180 years, after Christ or 150 years everybody just was like so stoned out on this rap that no organ no serious organization got done and they just waited for the end of the world in little communities practicing voluntary poverty and you know doing their thing and then it began to slowly dawn on people that it had been a long time since the Messiah's promise. And it was kind of stretching out a little. And so then certain mentalities in that situation said, uh, you know, this you know, return of the Messiah is all very well, but I think we should get some real estate under our control and uh, begin a vigorous building program and maybe... Uh, found some schools and stuff like that. So these religions began to become, to turn away from their end of the world ecstatic millenarianism and to see themselves as organizing for the long haul. And um, it was in this atmosphere that the hermetic books were produced and written down. The chief magical ritual of Hermeticism is the invocation, the ability to call stellar demons down into statues. And then these statues prophesy. And uh, this is why Christianity is, uh, it takes the Jewish aversion to idol worship and just raises it to a whole new level of intensity because they didn't they were freaked out by this animating of statues with stellar demons thing that the hermeticists were into yeah well this is a good question you know i mean when you're reading a 1500 year old account of a magical invocation uh, if we are to believe them what happened was by singing certain songs, burning certain incense, and performing these rituals uh, at certain times that were astrologically correct, they could cause these things called decans, which are, are zodiacal demons of some sort. There are three decans to each zodiacal sign. 
See, modern astrology has completely, largely forgotten this. I mean, there are people who do deconic astrology, but you have to pay through the nose because, of course, this is a lost and dying art. Uh, but they would somehow be able to draw these decans down into the statue and then they could uh, extract knowledge from the statue. And, uh, you know, th this, is, this would lay the basis for these sympathetic magics which were then later developed in the Renaissance. It's quite powerful, actually. This is why this book I recommended is so interesting, the one on spiritual and demonic magic by Walker, because it, uh, it shows you how by you living a certain life, you know, these Renaissance princes were incredibly wealthy. So you have a suite of apartments which overlook, uh, uh, you know, the Plaza San Marco in Venice. And certain colors are prescribed that the walls be painted. You only wear certain kinds of robes made of certain materials. You perform your magical invocations at certain times of day, burning certain incenses. And they were big on fresh air and light. It isn't the dark image of magic that we get of, you know, the stirring cauldron and the bat-faced familiar and all that. No, it's all about open air, light, wind blowing through, flowing silk robes. It, they were angelic magicians, is what they were, and they were evoking these things through the use of sigils, which are magical symbols. And then there became stress on magical alphabets. Enochian is one of these magical alphabets, or languages, rather. John Dee, remember I mentioned the whole 10-year episode with the showstone, well, one of the subjects which these entities that Dee and Kelly were dealing with returned to again and again and again were um, the, the uh, Enochian, this language which they said was the true language that Abraham used to communicate with the angels. And it has a special alphabet, uh, an alien alphabet, and there has even been published an Enochian dictionary of some four or five thousand words. Uh, there was a very bizarre, this is just a footnote, but a very bizarre episode in the mid-1950s. There was a, a woman who was a kind of clairvoyant, and uh, she was in contact with flying saucers. I mean, now everybody and their dog is in contact with flying saucers. But at that time, it was fairly rare. Rare enough that she became, uh, she became an object of interest to the CIA. And at one point, she was in the CIA building in Langley, Virginia, and they were interviewing her. And, uh, and uh, she said, well, there's a there's a flying saucer right outside the window. And, and these guys rushed to the window and looked, and there was some kind of thing in the sky. And she said, it's, it's giving me a message for you, for this colonel. <laughs> and, and, and the message was, Afa, 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 A-F-F-A. So he wrote this down. Well, then, I, 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 don't, I didn't read this. I looked it up. I had a hunch. Afa is the Enochian word for nothingness. Just more, more weirdness. Uh, angelic languages. You know, why do these DMT creatures, uh, why are they so concerned with language? Not only language, but alphabet. I had a very weird, in fact, you know, one of the high water weirdness events of my life was when I was young, I used to, uh, I was, I wanted the DMT flash to last longer, so I used to smoke it uh, at the height of LSD trips. And one uh, 
Christmas vacation, this rooming house that I managed in Berkeley had been, everybody had gone home for Christmas, I thought. And so I decided I would take some LSD and smoke DMT. And, um, and so I took the LSD and then I smoked the DMT. It was just nuts. I mean, it's nuts enough. But this was like turbocharged nuts. It went on and on and on. And finally, I, uh, there was a woman who I rented a room to upstairs uh, named uh, Rosemary, who was supposed to be in Minnesota. And she was an a actress and very projective and did everything with great flair. And she apparently came back early from Christmas vacation. So she hit the front steps running of this house and and used her key to let herself into the front door and came right around to my door and started beating on my door. Well, I am by nature a very paranoid person. I mean, I can be up the Rio Yaguas Yasu in the middle of the Amazon basin and if I'm out in the rainforest smoking a joint and a stick is broken anywhere near me, I immediately hide the dope, you know, and just, you know, I'm very paranoid. So this woman lets herself in and comes and beats with her clenched fist on, on my bedroom door. Well, I like underwent a, a coronary thrombosis or something, and I was in the elf space, and they were screeching and chattering and showing me all this stuff. And when she did this, I like I I flew off the bed. I jumped like I jumped two feet in the air and and landed on my feet. And it was it was as though and don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> it, it it was as though the uh, this sudden flash of adrenaline and this sudden movement that I made broke up the ordinary division between the trip and norm normality or something anyway I pulled the trip with me into the room I was now standing in the room eyes open but the the elf creatures had come with me and everything had just been like jacked up to some immense level of intensity and there were these rotating geometric things in the room uh, hanging in the air and it was like moving in this jerky motion this thing was going click 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 and it was faceted and every time it would make this large metallic click these plastic triangle shaped brightly colored chits or something like little pieces of a floor tile or something would fly across the room and each one of them had a letter on it in an alien language sort of like Hebrew or Sanskrit and it was just there were several of these machines and these things were ricocheting off the walls and I had an elf hanging off each hand and I was turning around and I was just saying holy shit you know I've pulled I, I'm 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 uh, and I and then she's still beating on the door, you know. So I stagger over to the door, fling it back, and look at her and say something like, "Way duquam wotsi ho wadi kwam haptiku putik shning." And then she realized at that point what my problem was and uh, and retreated. But I I've, I've never forgotten. It's the one time that it, that they went literary on me, and not only did I see them, not only did I hear them, but I they were printing on the air the message as well. Very curious. I mean, we don't, yeah, yeah. It's. <laughs> I don't know, the first, the first few times I smoked DMT, I had almost no ability to say anything about it at all. I remember the first time I did it, I've never actually seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me the first time. I came out of it and I said, I can't believe it. 
I can't believe it. I don't believe it. it. I don't believe it. And I said this about 200 times because I just, my life, I was blown out of the water. I'd spent years getting my act together and becoming a Marxist and a this and a that and had all this stuff all figured out, you know. And it just left me absolutely intellectually naked. It was that everything you know is wrong experience, except that it was from the toes, you know. I mean, everything I knew was wrong. I've never forgotten it. I mean, it is the most, uh, I don't know, it's like hitting the reset button on your whole cosmogonic myth. I mean, it, you just, uh, it's the convincer. You know, you occasionally meet people who say, <laughs> you people who take drugs, listen, you think I believe that this is anything more than you just hyping yourself up on this? They say, listen, you got ten minutes to put into exploring that point of view. Check this out, because it's, uh, it's confounding. I mean, people sometimes ask me, is it dangerous? It is if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> you know? Astonishment is something we rarely experience as the genuine article. We fake it. Say, oh, you've really surprised me. But, hey, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, it can really get wrathy. Yeah. You mentioned this thing called that for bad the use of the mantra. What would that be? Why did they... Uh, Mandayanism? Well, Mandayanism is a very old religion. Um, it arose around Jerusalem in the, a couple of centuries before Christ. It was a baptismal cult. And uh, I'm, I'm really into the Mandayans, actually. They were the oldest continuous Western religion in the world. Uh, uh, with a Gnostic intent and they started and they were probably they started out as Jews but they were persecuted they claimed John the Baptist as one of their own and he was a member of some kind of baptismal cult because we know he baptized Christ but they they were driven out of uh, the area around Jerusalem and then for centuries they were in Lebanon and then they slowly made their way across Persia and uh, they ended up in the swamps of Iraq and Iran. I know someone from there who called from Basra. Do you? From, is he from Basra? <laughs> is he from Basra, that city in the south? It's a very... Huh? It's still there. Yeah, there are a lot of going on over there. How do you know? I mean, I've seen footage of that before. I heard about that footage. Yeah, it's what you get out of it. People in London told me that they had seen it. I, I, he told me that because they're discriminated against, uh, you don't go around advertising the bar for these, you know, because the Muslims don't like them. And oh no, they don't like them. Well, Mandayans are very, very interesting. They, uh... uh they take a test. Yes, they have their own written language. Although in 1847, there was a cholera epidemic that wiped out 90% of the priesthood and only priests were allowed to learn to read and write this language. I have some uh, facsimile manuscripts from the Vatican Library. I sort of think that we all should become Mandayans, that of all the religions I've ever looked at and studied, it seems to me the most psychedelic, the most sort of ethically correct, I mean, they are in there, and it would be a great religion to practice on a world scale because they're into caring for the land. They're river nuts. They love rivers, and they build their, they build a cult hut called a mandai, and they always divert a little ditch through it, and then they do their, their ritual baptisms and stuff like that there. But their folk tales and their uh, religious beliefs are very interesting. It's like a religion of biology, 
the highest god in Mandayanism is called Hibal Zaiwa. And Hibal Zaiwa is always referred to as they. So it's that they are in charge. And it's uh, beautiful scriptural stuff. Uh, they're very much like Orthodox Jews, only more so in that if you're a, a, a religious Mandayan, your life is ruled by all kinds of uh, things, sort of like the rules of kosher. The most difficult rule that these people are asked to keep in their own lives is that if you're really a devout Mandayan, you are considered polluted if your eye falls on an unbeliever. And an unbeliever is a non-Mandayan. So you can imagine uh, how difficult it is when you're down to four or five hundred people to make sure that's the only people you ever see. The only profession that a Mandayan man can uh, follow and not require ritual decontamination every day is silversmithing. So if you ever go to Baghdad, <laughs> not likely too soon, but if you ever go to Baghdad or Basra or Kirkuk, there are communities of these people and you find them by going to the silver markets and then through discreet inquiry uh, you, you can find them. Well, in, if in folklore, uh, if folklorists, folkloric anthropologists have developed all these rules, if a religion makes something taboo, you can usually bet that that means they were into it at some point. Because when a religion makes something taboo, it means that there has been a reformist upheaval inside the religion. This is probably how Soma was lost to the ancient Hindus, you know. Uh, uh, it's how Zoroaster was called the great reformer. And he was the great reformer because he suppressed a lot of indigenous shamanic cults. Uh, and some people think that he actually attempted to suppress Hauma, and Hauma is the Avestan uh, counterpart of Soma. If any of you are interested in all this, this book by Flattery and Schwartz called, uh, uh, what is it called? Hauma and Harmaline in Iranian religion. It's from the University of California Press. And they make a very strong case that Soma couldn't, was not mushrooms, that it was Pagaman Harmala. And it's really a great, it's a really interesting book. I mean, I learned things that I had, didn't know. For instance, uh, in the pre-Zoroastrian phase of Iranian religion, drugs were not only used to access the spiritual world, but they actually said there was no other way to do it, which is sort of my position. So it was nice to know that these pre-Zoroastrian Iranian light religions, uh, they, they were into what they called the Menog, M-E-N-O-G, the Menog, and it's another dimension. And you can only attain knowledge of it through the use of drugs. But the Manang existence is where the dead people are. And what their religion was about was you get to know your own soul through using drugs and you approach the... It's like, a, it's like visiting somebody in stir. You go and your soul comes and meets you comes through the Manog existence and meets you at the membrane. And the idea is that during life, you must learn to recognize your soul. Because after death, if you can't pick it out of the soul swarm, then you will be somehow uh, incompleted in the after death world. Yeah. To attain death by astonishment. <laughs> well, 
Well, the, the DMT raises the possibility of death by astonishment. I was talking to somebody about it last night, saying, you know, when you take DMT, the question is not, <laughs> will I be all right? The question is, have I lived through it or not? <laughs> because you can't tell whether you've lived through it. DMT is this very short-acting hallucinogen that you smoke, but it's a neurotransmitter. It occurs in all human beings on the natch, and it occurs in a various plants and animals. In terms of nature, it's the commonest of all hallucinogens. In terms of impact, it's the strongest of all hallucinogens. I mean, it's a completely reality obliterating experience and it comes on so quickly that you don't grok it like a drug. I mean, we all know what a drug is, you know, you feel this, you feel that, it gets stronger, it makes you rest, finally it overwhelms you. This isn't like that. This is like that, you know, you and your friends are somewhere and there's talk about this drug and the pipe gets filled and this and that and then you're about to smoke this drug or maybe you just smoked it but anyway a 747 crashes into your apartment building at three times the speed of sound and interrupts whatever you were doing and sometimes people come out of it saying you know what happened what happened for crying out loud say nothing happened you just did it you mean say you mean that's it say yeah that that's what it does because it is not, it's more like, it happens so quickly that we interpret it as an event coming from the outside rather than a, a, a chemical compound diffusing through your body. Because it completely replaces reality, not with the contents of your unconscious or your unfulfilled dream wishes or any of that, but with an, another dimension a space filled with entities busy about their many tasks although they notice you and come flocking over with a piercing screech and begin to uh, they like to treat with you they play with you they're not entirely friendly it's sort of like I don't know, it's the kind of feeling I used to have in India when I would go to make these hash buys in these Indian markets and these guys would say, you know, welcome, welcome, you're my friend, I am not like all the others. <laughs> and what it was, was, you know, we were there to do business and so it was fine and everything usually went smoothly, but this was no environment into which to let your guard down or anything like that. You've had your hand. What does it do? What does DMT do in our brain as a neurotransmitter? We don't know. Nobody knows what it's doing there. And as long as the government makes it impossible for science to pursue rational questions or rational answers to these kinds of questions, it's not likely we'll ever find out. The best guess so far is that it mediates attention. That, for instance, if there were to be a noise over here or movement, and I turn and I... that that's a little spike of DMT makes that possible. It's where you suddenly narrow your awareness and project it deeply into a small, confined area. This was the best guess of the people who did work on it a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are a number of physioactive uh, tryptamines. Uh, DMT is not, if it's made right, not a cardioactive tryptamine. Sometimes when you smoke it, your heart races, but you can't tell whether that's sloppy synthesis or that you're scared, you know. It's made from tryptophan, which is an amino acid, one of the eight essential amino acids, and it's an easy conversion out of tryptophan.
Well, it can come from a plant, but if you were to ask a chemist to make it for you, he'd ask you to get him a, a few hundred grams of tryptophan. Can you, and uh, please distinguish between the kind of bandies that we encounter on DMT as against the kind that you found on mushrooms? Well, on mushrooms, you hear a voice. You don't rarely, at least in my experience, do you see who's talking. But on DMT, you, you all, all barriers are transcended in the first 30 seconds. I mean, you hear it, you see it, and sometimes you feel it, you know. These little entities, these self-dribbling basketballs, these things that I call the tykes, they jump into your chest. They jump into your chest, and then they jump out again. I don't know why they do that. In the Amazon, uh, among the tribes that use DMT derived from plants, they say, they call these spirit things, they call them hikuli. And they say that you're supposed to not, that they will jump into your chest, and then you're supposed to have a technique to keep them from getting out. And the number of these things that you trap inside your body cavity means indicates how powerful a shaman you are. Your magic is done through the hikulis that are trapped uh, inside of you. So you really don't have to see the You do, but it's fleeting. It's like, you know, it's, it's different. With DMT, it is more real than this experience of sitting in this room is real. I mean, it is confounding. It's very hard on DMT to tell yourself, this is a drug. I mean, good Lord, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like you just tunneled through an energy barrier into the beta sub X dimension, which is all the time all around us, but somehow you just became virtual and moved across the energy barrier, and there you are. You know, and the other thing about DMT that's weird is it does not affect your mind. In other words, you don't feel gaga with ecstasy. You don't feel relaxed. You feel exactly the way you felt before you did it. It's that the world has just been swapped out. And, and that's strange. I, I sort of like that, that it doesn't lay a glove on the observing cognitive processes. Instead, it just does something in the visual cortex that causes the, the world to be replaced by a three, four, five dimensional, highly colored, moving environment filled with screaming elf demons. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. More like 50 milligrams. We need to go to lunch. This is the last clip. Um, I heard somewhere that concomitant kind of use of MAO inhibitors increases the length of time that um, the DMT experience will last. Have you heard that? And if so, in what form are the MAO inhibitors taken? Okay, the question is that can you extend the life of a DMT flash if you predose yourself with MAO inhibitors? The answer is probably. This is really a don't try this at home, folks, maneuver unless you really know your MAO inhibitors. Uh, there are MAO inhibitors, synthetics, uh, that will inhibit every molecule of MAO in your body for up to six weeks after a single exposure. This you don't need. Uh, uh, an excellent MAO inhibitor for these purposes would be harmine or harmaline, which is, uh, which is uh, reversible in four to six hours. So if you take harmine and pre-dose it, but before you go extending your DMT trip with an MAO inhibitor, you better have just a, a, an ordinary, old-fashioned, regular DMT <laughs> trip and decide whether you really want to spend <laughs> more time in that place. Because, see, the hook is especially for smart-ass straight types, is that you say, look, it only lasts 10 minutes, 
for crying out loud. You want to have all these opinions on this subject, but you're not willing to invest 10 minutes. So most people, certainly I, the first, I said, I had taken LSD and all, and I thought, <laughs> 10 minutes, uh, bring it on. We'll go out and have a beer afterwards. Well, it turns out that in a holographic universe, 10 minutes, is indistinguishable from 50,000 years under the proper conditions. So we'll meet back here at 2.30. Okay. Uh, well, there seemed to be a lot of hands up when we left. Can anybody pick up the thread? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard of the self-transforming machine and stuff. And what... What I, I, no, I, I recognize you very much insist that this is the DMT realm is a very alien realm, very unlike something like the alien archetype, etc., etc. But when I hear your descriptions of these entities, which I have not encountered, though when I tried, was uh, I hear a fairly uh, uh, an image of an elemental spirit, which we would call it in Western sort of folk mythology. In the sense that one, just because you use the word elf, though I know they don't really look like necessarily like classical elves, but the sense of a small entity doing a lot of work that is neither good nor bad, in the sense it's sort of mischievous, it's, it's not demonic, but it's not, you know, an angel. And the sort of sense of them being small and doing a lot of work comes to me very much as sort of an impression of an elemental. And one, if you could just respond to that, and also, to me, and I just think of your own particular racial heritage and the fact that the main elemental spirits that one thinks of are often these little Celtic little fairy dudes, and whether how you sort of, whether, you know, I'm sure you thought of this to some degree, but how you sort of integrate these, these things. Well, uh, <clears throat> some of you may know this book, it's a classic called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries by Evan Svantz. And it was reprinted recently, and I wrote the introduction to it. It's an int it's, it mentions in there uh, when Saint when Patrick arrived as a missionary in Ireland to convert the pagan Irish. The problem that he encountered was this belief in the land of fairies, and he, in order to convert the pagan Irish. He uh, convinced them uh, that, uh, uh, that these were souls of the dead in an intermediate zone that was neither heaven nor hell, which he called purgatory. Purgatory was invented to accommodate the folk beliefs of the pagan Irish. And when it was brought back to Rome, uh, it seemed like such a good idea for converting all kinds of pagan peoples on the fringe of the expanding sphere of Christianity that it's been in place ever since. Uh, I've wondered, uh, I think I even talked sometime this week to somebody about, um, about the way in which there seemed to be, there's a kind of a racial or a genetic undertone about some of this stuff. The, I never really felt, I, I didn't know till I was 13 years old that I wasn't a white person. Because I grew up in Colorado where everything was white bread culture. And my father may have had opinions about the IRA and all that. But we were never told, you know, that we were Irish. And, you know, some of you who have roots in this city, city know that as recently as uh, 50 years ago, they used to have signs up along 8th Avenue that said, no dogs or Irish allowed. So, uh, you know, I, I reconnected to that part of the heritage. The Irish are uh, stereotypically known to be susceptible to intoxication, to be great word spinners, um, and to have this peculiar relationship to fairyland or something. Uh, I, would, I don't want to think that I'm just exploring the Celtic collective unconscious. It seems to me these things must be there for everybody. 
nevertheless, you know, we're so concerned to suppress racial differences because we're a democracy and because racial problems have haunted American politics from the very beginning that we tend to want to believe that everybody is different. I mean, everybody is the same. But in fact, um, you know, I took a course once at Cal, which w it was interesting. It was given by the forensics department, the only course I ever took in the forensics department. And it was called Biochemical Markers for Individuality. And one of the things we did, it was actually taught by Alexander Shulgin, the great drug designer. And one of the things we did is he brought in a little vial of some kind of chemical and he passed it around and out of uh, 200 people in the class, 198 couldn't smell it at all. And two people were so overwhelmed by the smell of this that they actually became physically sick for a few minutes. Well, what this is, and then he explained to us, these people were probably up to 50,000 times more sensitive to this chemical than uh, most people. And that this is a gene that you carry for sensitivity to this thing. Well, those kinds of compounds, um, aromatic compounds, pa compounds with an electronically active ring structure, are the very nearest relatives to drugs. And, uh, and so it's reasonable to suppose that there are genetic differences in the way we relate to drugs, which doesn't mean racial differences. It means from person to person. But it also may mean, you know, that uh, what a race is, is a, a collection of related genes that are more frequently found together than not. You know, this is why, technically speaking, you can never say so-and-so belongs to a race, because a race is a quality of a group. It's not something an individual is. You have to have a bunch of people before you can say that you're confronting a phenomenon of race. So it may be that what Aboriginal people believe is that there are shamanic lines, family lines, with a greater susceptibility to these things than others. So one of the things you learn when you begin to explore psychedelic substances is that it isn't hitting everybody the same way. In fact, it can hit people radically different ways. Um, society misrepresents drugs tremendously. For example, you know, we all know the stereotyped image of uh, the pothead. You know, the pothead can't work, can't remember. It's the inarticulate, dumb, hippie image. Well, I've never met anyone with a deeper devotion to cannabis than myself. And, you know, I'm very proud of my memory and my ability to get verbally organized under almost any condition. So I completely violate the stereotype of what it is to be a pothead. Well, how many people are there like that? I mean, I'm always amazed when people say, you know, no, I, I don't want to smoke any pot. It'll mess with my memory. I mean, really? It, how peculiar. So what you have to do, it's just like every other thing, everything you've been told is wrong, and you have to take life by the handlebars and figure out what's really going on, which doesn't mean that you're reckless. I mean, there are bad drugs, there are bad politics, there are bad relationships. I hope that answered your question. It was a two-part question, though. It still seems to me that these, that these entities are in many ways similar to the sort of elemental spirits. And whether you think of that as a possible explanation for... Well, when you say they're like elemental spirits, you mean they're like elemental spirits. Is that because you spend a lot of time with elemental spirits? Well, when you say they're like elemental spirits, is that because you spend a lot of time with elemental spirits? It's true. They are. I mean, they are... They don't look like them, though. They don't look like anything. The, uh, 
there was a really bad movie. Those of you who don't have kids can tune out here, but since I have kids, I've seen a lot of bad movies because that's what they make for kids. And I think it was four or five years ago at Christmas time, there was this movie called Santa Claus to tune out on. But there was one scene in the elves' workshop where they were making thousands of toys and there were all these conveyor belts going from level to level and these guys rushing around at full speed. It was the most DMT-like reconstruction uh, I've ever seen. So uh, it's funny, though, that the elf mythology doesn't carry the sense of strangeness that you get in the DMT flash, although I suspect that what that is is that we've been polluted by Disney. That Disney has given us this vision of fairies as number two, harmless. And, you know, it's the Tinkerbell phenomenon. Because if you go back before, you know, is it Andrew Lang who wrote all those books, the Blue Fairy Book, the Brown Fairy Book, the White Fairy Book? Those are weird, those stories. I mean, fairies are weird. They steal babies. That's their main uh, way of relating to human beings, is they steal human infants and, and leave behind wizened, deformed, sickly creatures who become very strange and peripheral kinds of human beings. And fairies, if you get trapped in fairyland, the only way out is through, and they're language-oriented, they will never do you damage if you, if you can convince them that you're a master of words. You know, it's poetry that they like. And uh, I, all over the world, there is this persistent motif of these small entities. Well, I'm not suggesting that they're really there, but I don't know what's going on. I mean, it's odd that they should persist. And, and that they should be experientially available. I mean, you have to understand, I mean, a different person saying this to you, it would be a whole different thing, you know, if it was Madame So-and-so Egyptian and uh, so forth and so on. I'm pushed to this stuff by, by experience because my inclination is toward reason, you know? It's just that... Everybody moves along safe channels. Everybody stays out of the fast lane. And if you move to the edges, and drugs are certainly an edge, and uh, you know a full exploration of one's sexuality is certainly an edge, and going off to weird corners of the world and staying long periods of time is certainly another edge, and if you do these kinds of full affirming world of white bread, European, bourgeois, work hard uh, uh, types, just looks as weird as uh, any cultural adaptation could possibly be. I mean, I have said many times, and you probably agree to some degree, that reality is created by language. But we don't realize how true this is that reality really is created by language and that we are all imprisoned in somebody else's language. This isn't how we want to talk. Most of the words, I'd say 90% of the words and constructions we use would be great-grandfather. You know, we are living inside a 90% 19th century worldview. And uh, culture cannot evolve any faster than its language evolves because what cannot be said cannot be done. What cannot be said cannot be put in place. So in a way, one uh, way of thinking about psychedelics is that they um, empower language. It's a way to force the evolution of language. The way you stretch the envelope of culture is by creating language. Everybody, I mean, this happens unconsciously in society. You know, Hasidic Jews or reggae people or whatever, the way they create their boundaries 
is through language. You know? I mean, the Catholic Church, this is how they do it. I mean, speaking Yiddish is a way to do it. Uh, it you, you create a new reality inside the old one, and you can do it by moving backward into a specialized language, or you can move forward into a new language. I mean, look at how the um, introduction of the computer has transformed our language in the 70s and the 80s. I mean, draw CPU, throughput, output, input, bug, glitch, all of this stuff. These are words that have been empowered by our involvement with a machine. Now, before that, the major influence on language in my lifetime uh, was the LSD episode of the 1960, and it always amuses me how much time and energy the establishment spends on heaping abuse on hippie talk. And, and it's even now, it's sold to you guys as West Coast talk. It's sold on the West Coast as LA talk. It's sold, here you are, you're close to it, but not of it. It's, it's like they used to say of the Watergate scandal, linked but not tainted. Uh, the, and what LSD did, I mean, I can remember, uh, I can remember, if I can remember, uh, words like, uh, or a concept like ego trip. The first time I heard that, I didn't know what it meant. I couldn't even, I didn't have the concept. Well, then once somebody explains to you the concept, then you've got it. Vibes. That notion introduced a whole bunch of people to the idea of emotions. He said, you know, you walk in the room, it was a bad vibe, man. It means that there's no rational deconstruction of what was going on, but you could just tell it was not a place you wanted to be. So it began to empower new realities that were able to emerge. And it was very important, I think, to the establishment to suppress that, because new, reality, new words are the, the, uh, the beginnings of new realities. That, you know, it, the gay thing is an interesting example of that. I mean, it goes from, what was it called in the 19th century? The love that dare not speak its name. Interesting. See, it was there, but you dare not speak its name. Somehow to name it was to bring it too much into the forefront. And, and, and people who were gay, nobody could anybody. I mean, it was worse than being a communist. Now, it's empowered. And all the various racial groups who have had to come up through the American meat grinder have had to create vocabularies of community that they were uh, proud of, you know, rather than accepting the vocabulary of the, of the dominator culture. I mean, I, you know, a good example is the NAACP. You know, the words colored people is embedded there, and yet these were the sincerest and most radical people in that movement. At a certain point, they did the dominator designation for their subgroup and constantly oppressed minorities are trying to get the language right. And it's important for us to do this too. I mean, are we stoners? Are we heads? Are, are we shamans? What are we exactly? Well, pouring, pouring psychedelic substances into that mix then opens the doorway for the logos to define you. And building community is part of this. It's, we are an interesting potential community because we tend, unfortunately, toward the lily white but not concerned. Uh, I, I don't see any class dominating there are probably people in this room who could buy and sell all the rest of us without going past their small change. There are also probably people who scraped and saved for this weekend and could ill afford it. We don't seem to be embedded in that class structure so much. Uh, maybe we represent a level of education 
maybe we're some kind of generally definable group of people by level of education, but I don't see that either. What holds us together is what holds all subcultures together, which is an experience. In this case, not the ex something else, but the experience of being loaded. And, um, you know, it's a very powerful and immediate kind of experience. And I'm sure some of us are more loaded than others. And uh, in any subgroup, you'll get that uh, kind of a spectrum. Yeah. Um, well, this is just, I don't want to harp on this. So the DMT thing, what do you go to it now for? I mean, have you gotten familiar with the terrain, or is it every time it's shocking and it's the first time? It's always pretty shocking. Uh, I'm, I've spent a lot of time on it. What happens for me is that these entities want me to do what they're doing. And what they're doing is using sound to make objects appear out of the air. They can sing objects into existence. And this, I, I think that they're language elves. They're not made of matter. Well, then what are they made of? It seems as though the place you go on DMT is made purely of language. It's as though there is a, a syntax, a hard thing to picture. But they are more like sometimes they, how can, well, hmm. they're like sentences rather than organisms. The essence of their presentation is like that of a pun. And so what they want you to do is they want you to learn to make a better kind of language. They want you not more articulate, not more clearly defined, but they actually believe or suggest that there can be an, a dimensional breakthrough into a language that is seen with the eyes. This is, I think that the breakthrough that we're waiting for is not going to come out of a political movement or a redistribution of wealth or anything which could be called political. It's going to come out of a shift in the body. And uh, these things happen. I mean, it's very mysterious how it happens. Like, think about language, ordinary language. Here you have two people. One is mute, and the other has the ordinary powers of speech. They look exactly alike. You can't tell a mute person from anybody else. And fairly complex behavior. Language is a behavior of some sort. And it's very hard to imagine that it slowly insinuated itself into our being. It looks to me more like it was a kind of quantum, uh, a quantum leap of some sort and probably appeared very suddenly. And uh, there have been other less dramatic but more recent things like this going on. For example, you know, you go to school and they teach you in the, um, in the 15th century, perspective was the thing for me to understand. I mean, perspective was discovered? How could it be discovered? I mean, you just walk, here it is, right? Uh, and, and say, no, before 1425, people didn't know that the part of the house farther from you was smaller than the part of the house. You can't understand. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Uh, another example is um, um, St. Augustine, who was this great father of the church and who was, by the way, African. And he, he was known as the most brilliant theologian of his age. And the way he would prove to people that he was an exceptional and holy man was they would open a book of theology in front of him and let him look at it for a few minutes 
And then they would close the book and he would be able to tell them what was written there. As far as we can tell, St. Augustine was the only man in Europe who could read silently. Can you imagine this? It was a miracle. He said, we don't know how the bugger does it. You just show him the book, and then he can tell you what's written there. Meanwhile, everybody else has to say, oh, the buzz, the buzz, the buzz, the buzz, the buzz. And um, now we've completely assimilated this, although there are still a few among us who move their lips when they read. Uh, Vladimir Novikov used to cruelly sneer at these people. He said once in an interview, he said, I didn't write books for people who move their lips when they read. Um, so, and, and a final example, which will indicate that we've come to the end of the line, in terms of sudden behaviors emerging, is uh, according to my friend Bill Gibson in his book, The Difference Engine, uh, uh, oral sex was virtually unknown in England until the middle of the 19th century and then it w was brought in by French prostitutes and it was just a mind-boggling concept <laughs> to these Victorians. They could not wrap their mind around it. Well, you know, from our vantage point we probably assume people have been into this since the Stone Age Maybe they have, but at least for several centuries in Victorian England, it absolutely died out as inconceivable. And, uh, you know, breakdancing is another one of these where a behavior suddenly emerges, completely coherent and formed, and then it recedes. So I, or, or if it has cultural utility, it's stabilized, such as my previous example. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so what these, what these tykes seem to be trying to say is there is a way for you to use your voice in order to activate a language which is not culturally taught. It isn't that you learn it from your parents, but that it's in the bone a poetic language, a language scripted into your genes, and not only is it an Urschbrock, an original speech, the vehicle of primal poetry, it can be seen. And, you know, it's interesting how in our culture, when we talk about how somebody is really a gifted speaker, we always reach for visual metaphors. We say, I see, I see what you mean, you know? And in Spanish, they say, if they're talking to you and they want to know if you're following, they say, is it clear? Claro? Claro, it means, is it clear? It's a visual metaphor. Say, she paints a picture, uh, or he, his words have great clarity. What this means is that unconsciously, we trust the eyes, and we don't trust the ears. And uh, telepathy, which most people, I think, think of as being able to hear somebody else think, is not that at all. What telepathy is, is when you see what other people mean. Because when you see what somebody means, it's like standing in their shoes. Point of view. That's a very visual Oriented. If you can understand somebody else's point of view, you are that person in that moment for that purpose. And I think that it's amazing that the world has evolved as far and as fast as it has, the human world, glued together by nothing more than small mouth noises. I mean, that's what we're talking here, small mouth noises. As monkeys... We're set up for this. I mean, you can talk longer than just about any other activity that you can do without becoming exhausted. I mean, I'm the living proof of it. Uh, a very small amount of energy is required to keep the old tongue and lips going with the air moving out. I mean, imagine if we had to communicate as deaf people do with sign language all the time. 
this is exhausting. I mean, nobody communicates like that for four or five hours at a stretch, and yet Castro can give a four-hour speech at uh, the drop of a hat. So we're set up for this. The problem is um, it, it requires an, uh, a um, congruence of interior dictionaries because what happens is my words go across space as an acoustical signal. They enter your ear. You are very rapidly looking up each word as it comes in and comparing it to your definition. And as long as we don't look too closely at this, communication seems to be happening. The biggest showstopper there is in most situations is to say to somebody, now would you explain to me what I just said to you? Because then it turns out, you know, the definitions are wildly variant. I mean, it's not so wild if you're saying, you know, since you're up, would you get me a grant? Although even that's ambiguous. Maybe they say, why don't you just have one grant, you know? Uh, but if you get into deep stuff, if you're saying, you know, the ontological modalities of the post-Renaissance mind have issued into a situation of deconstructionist vitality such that all bets are off, <laughs> say, now would you explain to me what I just said? I can't even do it with myself. I mean, people say, would you repeat what you just said? No chance, you know. <laughs> So, so, uh, and I, I've looked at this, uh, and there are models for this kind of verbal communication. Did we talk yesterday about the octopi and all that? No, thank God. Uh, well, see, whenever you think you're about to take a step that nobody has taken and go a place nobody's ever been, if you look back at Mother Nature, you can usually find that you've been scooped. And a, a very interesting example of this vis-a-vis -vis language is um, what's going on with octopi. Octopi and squids, as you may or may not know, but most people know it because they absorb all these TV shows about nature. Somebody once said to me, I know you don't like television, but it's a wonderful way for my children to learn about nature. <laughs> anyway, what we've all learned from watching these wonderful shows about nature is that octopi can change colors. And most people think it's because they're into camouflage. You know, you move on to green seaweed, you turn green, brown rocks, you turn brown. It isn't that at all. It's something much uh, more profound. It's that um, all over the surface of octopi are these specialized cells called chromatophores. And they can change into many colors. And not only can the octopus change colors, but the ordinary rubbery smooth surface of the octopus can be made like goosebumps, but more dramatically wrinkled very suddenly. The other thing about an octopus is because they're soft bodied when they're in water, which is their natural element, they are very, very adept at folding and unfolding various parts of their body so they can reveal a part of their body and then fold in and then show another part and they're like a silk scarf in water. Well, what's going on here is that octopi communicate with each other by the way they look. And at first this doesn't seem so profound, it just seems interesting. But when you analyze what's happening, you realize that this is a profound evolution in the project of communication because there is no culturally sanctioned dictionary among octopi. And really what is happening is the octopus wears its mind on its surface. 
they have a vast repertoire of dots, uh, blushes, traveling patterns that move across their surface. And these behavioral displays indicate the internal state of the organism. It is literally, it wears its language on the surface of its skin. It is a syntactical creature. Its behavior is its syntax. And, um, you know, some of these octo the octopi as a whole, they're mollusks. They're not even vertebrates. I mean, these things split from the line of development that leads to us 700 million years ago. I mean, you want to talk about an alien form of life. An octopus is about as far away from the human experience as you can possibly get. They evolved in shallow coastal waters, but then because so many things were evolving in those shallow waters, some of them evolved into the benthic depths. And in those depths, there, aren't, there is no light. So in order to preserve their ability to communicate over long periods of time, they evolved phosphorescent chromatophores all over their body. And some octopi even have uh, eyelid-like membranes put on various places of their skin so that they can blink very rapidly and modulate the phosphorescent light. So you can imagine in the darkness of the benthic depths of the ocean, the communication between two octopi is just a dance of lights in utter darkness. I mean, these are its naked mind in the water. And uh, when they are in communication like that, they are for all practical purposes one organism. This is why octopi excrete ink into the water. It's so that they can have a private moment, you know? Essentially, the octopus ink is the equivalent of correction fluid, you know? You, you just have to erase, you say, I didn't mean that at all. And then, you know, here's what I really meant. Well, I, uh, this is why I'm interested in virtual reality. Because it seems to me what we're trying to do is some kind of striptease of the mind. We want to get the mind naked. Because if it can be made naked, then uh, we will understand each other. We are clothed in flesh and then clothing. And then class difference, race difference, age difference, income difference. But if you could see the mind naked, the commonality of human beings would be reinforced and the presence of ego among us would be diminished. Also, there's no ambiguity in visible language. It's interesting that in the book of Revelations, there is this talk about how there is this sword which comes out of the mouth. It's describing a word which can be seen. And the whole history of the evolution of the Western mind is, in a sense, the birth of the Logos. The Logos is making its way towards self-expression. And it's doing this by claiming dimension after dimension of uh, uh, manifestation. And I think that electronic media and electronic culture and drugs and the mixing of all our world cultures together, what this is empowering is a visible logos, a logos that is beheld and therefore lacks ambiguity. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're just lying. What do you all say that you are soul? Well, mind and soul in my estimation, uh, probably not correctly, tend to migrate toward each other. You know, in the late medieval period, you get a lot of talk about is the spirit the same thing as the soul, and are these things the same as the intellect? I mean, yes, we are soul, but I would say mind is the visible manifestation of soul. 
that would be a good Catholic definition because you see that keeps soul out of animals. If you say mind is the visible manifestation of soul, then you have restricted the existence of soul to the human species. Well, that seems somewhat more uh, Western scientific ideology. I think the uh, Sufi narrative, uh, Khan, would say in Catholic language that the intuition are the higher form of intelligence than the mind. Well, the mind is not a form of intelligence. The mind is the theater in which intelligence is manifested. You don't want to confuse the garage with the car. Right, about the feeling. I mean, there really is a balance of power where you give it heart and mind, and never just the mind or never just the heart. Well, you know, using all the equipment, right? Well, maybe I sort of hear you associating mind to brain because you're saying heart and mind. I mean, mind is heart. Everything goes on within the confines of mind. It's like the light that you switch on when you walk into a darkened room. And then everything else is the furniture within the room. Mind is simply the light which is shed over the landscape of appearances. You know, I mean, this is only my definition. I'm aware of the Neoplatonic emphasis on the mind. I think they called it the ends and so forth and so on. But in modern psychological terms, the mind is just the theater of cognition in some way. Mind, consciousness. No, consciousness is something which happens in the mind. I mean, there is an unconscious mind as well. Mind is the inclusive category, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's very good that, you know, the hardest thing to um, figure out is a mirror because what a mirror shows you is yourself. But a mirror is not yourself. A mirror is a piece of glass with silver vapor deposited on the back of it. But that's a very different thing from yourself. And in this psychic domain, in this psychedelic space, you are not simply perceiving that space. You are creating it with your expectations as well. So if you have strong expectations of a certain sort, that will be the character of the thing. Uh, I think we talked about this yesterday, about how here we have peasant A chopping wood in the woods, and suddenly there a ripple of heat passes through the forest, and a hackle-raising sense of weirdness. And this guy throws down his axe and looks over his shoulder and a light is descending from the sky. Now what happens next, interestingly enough, depends on the year and the place. If the year is, um, let's say, 1000 and the place is southern France, then the Virgin Mary will be descending from the sky. If the place is Kansas and the date is 1958, then the space people are descending from the sky. You see, what happens is that um, when there is cognitive dissonance, good old psychological phrase, when there is cognitive dissonance, the mind rushes forward to provide explanation. I mean, it's amazing. You just walk with people and walk outside and there's a little light in the star, in the sky. It's no big deal, just a moving light. 
And everybody will say, oh, I wonder if it's a UFO. It means, you know, they've got something hiding in the back of their mind. And if anything gets slightly weird, they will rush this explanation forward. Uh, and for some people, you know, it's, it's Jesus, and for somebody else, it's Maitreya or somebody. So cultural expectations uh, are, are inextricably woven in to these strange encounter scenarios. There was an interesting UFO theory a few years ago that I thought was kind of cute. I didn't exactly believe it. But uh, these people, uh, Michael Persinger and uh, some Lafreniere, they wrote a really amusing book called Space-Time Transience and Unusual Events. And one of the things they came up with was uh, along earthquake faults, you get the grinding of enormous masses of rock together. And if these rock masses have a high in, uh, percentage of quartz in them, you can get what is called piezoelectric phenomena. Now, a piece, piezoelectricity is uh, simply a, a peculiar form of static electricity, but what it would uh, do is it would create ball lightning in the sky, which would follow these stress lines in the earth. And, you know, there is a connection not understood between earthquakes and, uh, and the appearance of UFOs. But one of the interesting things that Persinger discovered about piezoelectricity is that if you, in the laboratory, build piezoelectric generators that generate fields of enormous strength, then as a person is exposed to these things, they actually mess with your mind they actually treat people become more and more confused and uneasy and ultimately panic stricken in the presence of these piezoelectric fields well once you pass the panic moment then your mind is going to start telling you what's happening it's going to say you know uh, you're having an encounter something weird is going on and then out of the unconscious comes the projection the flying saucer the Virgin Mary, the elf invasion, the manifestation of Maitreya, whatever it is. So it's that mind goes to meet the unknown, but not without a hell of a lot of baggage of its own, which it immediately tries to unpack and put into the drawers of the other as soon as it arrives. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to test your theory. Right. Oh, dear. No, sorry, the mind is not the too fast and too brilliant for me too. <laughs> um, the mind is not intelligence. It's not the soul. It, it's sort of the theater in which all these other things take their place. Somebody behind. Yeah. yeah uh, who's the guy you mentioned that you've seen uh, in the Amazon? shooting beams of red lights in magical battles. Could you describe a, a magical shamanic battle, how it would occur? Yeah, would that be a psychedelic battle where the energy current shot back and forth? Well, all I have is the anecdote, which I'll tell you. When, when uh, uh, Kat and I were in the Amazon in 76 taking ayahuasca, we got in with this certain group of people in Peru that took it every week. And, you know, cultures have different ways of handling hassle. And in some cultures it's confrontational, in other cultures not. The way these Peruvian country folk operated was if somebody was screwing up, nobody would ever say so. They would just talk about these people behind their back until the morphogenetic field of gossip was so strong that you would basically awaken to the problem. So there was a complex social situation going on in this ayahuasca circle, which was there was a master shaman who we were apprenticed to, who was beloved by his neighborhood, but he had a, a a, a nephew, a sobrino, 
who was a jerk. I mean, this guy was, uh, as Don Fidel said, ambitious. He dealt a little weed, he did a little pimping, he was just sort of an edge runner type of guy. And every Saturday night we would all get together and take ayahuasca, about 30 of us. Older shamans, our guy, people from the neighborhood, and this sobrino, Don Jose. So, uh, I don't know what the real history of it was, because I had just arrived on the scene. But these old guys would sing these ikaros, these magical songs on ayahuasca that appear as colored tapestries in front of your eyes. And you know, they were, they had soul, they were into it, they were, and this guy would sing against them. I mean, it's the rudest thing you can possibly imagine. I mean, imagine if, if, you know, Lou Reed were trying to give a performance and the guy in the third row just launched into Old Man River <laughs> and kept at it, you know? I mean, in this town, I'm sure large guys would appear and say, Sir. <laughs> in Peru, it didn't work like that. They just kept singing. He kept singing. And it was clear that this is how it was going to be handled, that we had just divided into two separate entities here. Well, um, my uh, wife was sitting next to me, and he was sitting across the room from us, the Sabrino. And I had been watching him for a long time, and I was loaded to the gills. And I could see he would get up on his haunches, and he, he looked like a monkey. He, he, his face... It was uncanny. I mean, he looked like a monkey, and he also looked kind of like a jackal, a dog with long teeth. Kept going through these changes, and and Cat leaned over to me and said something like, "This guy is an asshole." And I, I just said, "You know, let it slide. What do we know? Think of it as anthropology." <laughs> but she she wasn't having it. So after a while, um, he kept doing this. And at one point, and everybody in the room, every person in the room was bummed out. And they were looking at their laps. All eye contact was broken. It's actually, when I was a kid, I invented a word. The word is fardow. And it means the embarrassment you feel when someone else fucks up. You know, and you happen to just be there, but somehow the aura of it is so strong. So the entire room is just awash in fardo. And the old guys are singing, and the guy is singing. So then at the end of a particularly intense clash of these two styles, uh, my wife just looked across the room at this guy and, like, put the whammy on him. And I saw these red arrows leave her eyes and like like dotted lines go across them <laughs> and they move fairly slowly you know more slowly than you could throw a ball or something well when this line of red arrows got to this guy he was knocked off his feet he, he fell backwards with his legs in the air and there was a big noise and all the singing stopped and everybody in the room looked up and these three old shaman who were sitting behind Don Fidel, who I to that point had not heard speak any language but Quechua, one turned to the other and he says in Spanish, Oh, the gringa sends the zabudabara. <laughs> you know, yeah. You mean becoming a jaguar and all that? Yeah. What, what's happening there? Or the, the night bird? The night bird, the owl, the, the, the... It's... It's... Everything happens. I mean, they used to... When I first went to the Amazon, they used to say to us, the, the Indians and the folks who helped us haul our stuff around, they, they would say, uh, La selva como un sueño. It's like a dream. The forest is like a dream. And I thought that that was a, a poetic metaphor of some sort, you know, like it's not. It's that um, 
You need to read various people who've written on the boundary between wilderness and settled space. When you go into the jungle, language becomes everything. And unbelievably bizarre things happen. And they really do happen. I've seen this in, in myself because when I first went to the Amazon, I knew virtually no botany. I only knew drug botany because I was so focused on that. We would row down, we would go down these jungle rivers and there would be hours that would pass where no, no words related to where I was would come to me. I called it the big green. That's what it was to me. It was the big green and there was a lot of different kinds of green and that was it. Well, then the next time I went to the Amazon, I was with professional field botanists. And we would go out into the jungle, and these guys were just like children. You know, and say, look at this. This is a palacorea. Look at these varola trees. Uh, look at this hyalcyanthus. Look at this. Look at this. And soon my mind was filled with language about the green. And the green all disappeared. And instead there were plants that I knew and that were familiar to me. And this coming to terms with a local language is very interesting. You see, we, you speak the language you speak in most cases because of where you were born. If you were born in Russia, you speak Russian, China, Chinese. And an interesting thing about these languages is that you really can, they say you can never go home again, but in this rap, you never can leave home. You know, you go to the Amazon, but if you're explaining it to yourself in the language of uh, the East Village, you never leave the East Village. You know, you have somehow carried an envelope of local association with you, and you can never break through it. And so, in a way, you never see the place where you are. It's very important to try and make some accommodation to the local language because, in a way, only the local language is appropriate to the place. You know, France is a good example. It doesn't make any sense if you don't speak French. Germany makes no sense if you don't speak German. Uh, somehow the local language is a part of the local reality and, and we ignore all this and behave as if everything is very straightforward the one thing you learn taking psychedelics is that nothing is straightforward anybody yeah uh-huh there's one transcendental object that exerts attraction wherever it can. You see, evolution, in, what evolution seeks to do is to stop itself. Every organism wants to evolve into what's called a climax ecosystem. That's where everybody has their chair and nobody moves. So there are no empty chairs. You see, everyone has a place to sit, but there are no empty chairs. Where you get evolution is where you have a room half full of empty chairs. And then you have the choice of where to sit. Uh, most animal species and plant species are not evolving or are evolving very slowly uh, because what... Uh, uh, 
evolution tends to dead end itself. I mean, take cockroaches, for example. Uh, cockroaches achieved their present evolutionary status 200 million years ago. They haven't changed an iota. We can dig up fossils from the Pennsylvania coal beds that have cockroaches no different except slightly larger than the ones running around in your apartment. So this has been clearly a very successful strategy for cockroaches if the only thing that matters is uh, you know, the propagation of more cockroaches. Nevertheless, their cultural accomplishments have been dismal. <laughs> so, until recently, yes. <laughs> I, I had a friend once who, who seriously claimed that 60% of the structural integrity of New York City uh, was contributed by cockroaches between the walls, and that if all the cockroaches were to ever march out, the whole thing would just fall down. You see, uh, it's thought by the straightest people in the biz that before human beings, the major force creating evolutionary opportunity uh, were rivers. And this happens because the course of rivers will vary over time, and that means that rivers expose and inundate a lot of land. So along rivers, you find what is called, um, well, I can't remember what it's called. I'll name it. It's called unclaimed territory sandbars and, and large areas where nothing grows. Well, into those kinds of areas, what are called volunteer species or invader species can make their way. And these invader species uh, evolve very rapidly. For instance, in a climax tropical rainforest, what you find are enormous trees and vines, and then the epiphytes and stuff that grow on them. But these trees may flower once every 20 years or so. And when they do flower, they often produce a very limited amount of fruit. What you find along rivers in places like that are what we call weeds. And what a weed is, is a plant that is, number one, annual. It dies every year. And weeds produce enormous amounts of seeds. A weed strategy is a strategy for the rapid invasion and claiming of empty land. And before human beings, uh, rivers were the major creators of empty land. Uh, Carl Sauer, who was a biologist and a geographer, he said, uh, man found the earth a climaxed rainforest and we will leave it a weedy lot. What that means is we create so much waste land that these annual heavy seeding uh, rapacious plants uh, are replacing the, the products of climaxed evolution, which are enormous trees and vines and that sort of thing. Anybody else? This is your last crack. Uh, which book does he talk about? Well, I don't know which particular book. It might be a dimension voice. Oh, Voyage to Magonia is a good one. Is it the new one? I haven't read the new one. I, I think Jacques Vallée, I have a, a, a lot of respect for most of his work. I thought that book, The Messengers of Deception, was so off the track that I actually went to a book signing of his and leafleted the crowd uh, with an attack on it. it. shows you what a nut I am. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jacques Vallée had a very interesting approach to understanding flying saucers, and I still think this is the best method. He, 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 his argument went something like this. He said, it's, it's not productive to ask where the flying saucers come from or, or what they want. He said, the way to understand flying saucers 
is to uh, analyze their effect. If you can analyze their effect, that's what they're doing. That's what they want to achieve. So what are flying saucers doing? <laughs> well, they do talk shows, but what is the effect of them doing all these talk shows? What they are doing is they are causing vast numbers of people to doubt science. The re if you analyze what the effect since 1948 of the flying saucers is, is they have caused millions of ordinary people to think scientists don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> That's right, that it offers a new alternative. Well, now, uh, here, here's an interesting analogy, and it's not mine, it's Jacques Vallée's. But let's think, we've been talking so much today about the late Roman Empire. Here's another take on the late Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was this immensely successful civilization in that it was able to export its vision of an imperial center over vast parts of the world. The problem with the Roman Empire was that it was an ethical disaster. Uh, first of all, it ran entirely on the backs of slaves. So anybody who, te who starts talking to you about the grandeur that was Rome, you know, should be reminded Ro the grandeur of Rome was it was a bargain basement on three floors masquerading as a military brothel. It w was not a great civilization. And what happened to Rome? Well, they had all these people inside the empire, uh, among them Jews. And over there in Jerusalem, a long way from Rome, where communication was difficult, um, this story got loose among the Jews. And from the point of view of the Roman Imperium, the Jews were a barbarian people. I mean, they were Semites, and they had some strange religion, and so forth and so on. They were looked upon, in other words, as primitives. And so, uh, and, and if you were to have sat down to have dinner with a typical Roman bureaucrat of the Imperium, you would discover that the table talk would be all about democracy and atomism, epicureanism, stoicism, and skepticism. In other words, they were thoroughly modern people, and they thought they had very advanced bullshit detectors. And so then, you know, it, it comes to the attention of this Roman noble that the, the house slaves the kitchen boys and the, and the gardeners are all whispering and all excited about some, some Galilean magician who's running around uh, uh, the eastern Mediterranean telling people that not only can he rise from the dead, but so can you. And a Roman uh, sophisticate looking at this would say, you know, these primitive uneducated, colored people that we have to put up with, uh, you know, why don't these people uh, uh, step out of their own private Idaho and get with the program and study a little Greek philosophy? They're just superstitious. Well, hey, in a world where information moved no faster than a horse could gallop, within a century these uneducated, superstitious people and their irrational religion of magical redemption were hammering at the gates of Rome. And a century after that, the emperor himself, a god, for political purposes, has to make Christianity the official religion of the empire. In other words, what happened was that... Uh, Political and technological and architectural accomplishments got way, way out in front of ethics. And at that point, the unconscious said, I'm going to 
pull the rug out from under these Roman dominator types. I'm going to unleash a religious system in their very midst that will be an informational virus that they'll be dead before they ever know what hit them. And this is what Christianity is, you know. I mean, it was a religion of the displaced underclasses of the empire. And within 300 years, it took over and began its own pogroms and genocidal programs of extermination. Uh, the flying saucer is a similar thing. We have achieved great things in technology and in social organization and in scientific research. But like the late Roman Empire, ethics and morality have lagged far behind. And so now, uh, the same unconscious that sent us the mystery of the virgin birth and the resurrection, which completely confounded Roman rationalism, I mean, what were they to make of that? A virgin birth and a resurrection from the dead. They send us the flying saucers. And the flying saucers are destroying the faith in the scientific control systems and managerial theories at the very center of our civilization, just as surely as the Roman Imperium was broken by this superstitious religion. So what it is, is that there is a force in this world, call it the unconscious, call it the cosmic giggle, call it whatever you want. But when a society gets all twisted and out of balance, it can pull it down in a hurry. And I think the psychedelic thing in the 60s was viewed this way. It's that the dominator society is incredibly fragile. I mean, that's why whenever you see somebody who has to pile up guns and guns and guns, it means that they're not terribly confident of their ability to keep control of the scene. And we have so many kinds of guns pointed at us. Propaganda, social engineering, manipulation of the media. They do it all to us, and they still can barely keep ahead of it. They hate the spread of unreason. They hate psychedelic drugs. Hell, they don't even like people to work up a sweat on the dance floor. Anything, anything which bespeaks uh, anything other than ladylike and gentlemanlike, parlor-oriented, English upper-class behavior completely drives them into a swivet. And, and yet, you know, they launch horror upon the world that makes anything the Roman Imperium undertook look like child's play. I mean, this stunt they pulled with Iraq, you know, where they could kill, who knows, 100,000, 200,000. They don't even count the dead when they get pissed off. So um, that's why I think this archaic revival is in full throttle right now. I think the dominator model is doomed. And all the things that are coming forward, you know, the assertiveness of racial minorities, the assertiveness of sexual and intellectual minorities, people are just saying, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. And don't tell us what to believe, and don't tell us what drugs to take, and don't tell us what's politically correct, because your record is a nightmare. And this general discontent spreading through society is, I think, keeping a lot of these dominator types up late at night trying to figure what's going on. I mean, can you imagine being in charge of the planet as though, you know, suppose you were the CEO of General Motors or something like that. I mean, every piece of data that crosses your desk says, you know, you're in trouble, big trouble. Somebody had a question. Yeah. I, I just came back to your about the extraterrestrial visitation. Are you saying these things are, are merely some kind of objections that have no objections? No, I'm saying they're coming from another dimension of some sort that actually has a plan for the human race that is larger than the, the plan of the people who seek to run this society. Their plan, it's a brilliant plan, their plan is let's keep everything as much the same as possible. 
I mean, since World War II, they have been at war with the future. They do not want to let the future happen. And of course, the future is building up like a log jam in a river. And what it means is when the future finally tears loose and overwhelms these structures that they have built, it's going to be more dramatic, more sudden, more violent than they could ever have dreamed of or imagined. You, the establishment, yeah. Who, who are they? Who? The are what? They want to protect us from this the future? No, they're forcing the evolution of language. The real cataclysmic future does not lie in the propagation of the errors of industrial materialism. The real transformation of the future is built into the rocks, the ocean, the animals. It's, uh, it, it's not coming from human beings. The people who think they're running the world are dreaming. I, I have, I'm completely convinced that no one is in control and that this is very good news. You know, nobody is in control. Not the Communist Party, the Vatican, the World Bank. Nobody is in control. There may be groups who dream of controlling, but their frustration level must be approaching infinity at this point. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. No, no, this was a military event. Alaric the Visigoth and his folks were moving south through the Peloponnesus. And uh, they were burning and destroying everything in their path. I mean, when we say that they burned Eleusis, it, it was in the act of burning Greece that they burned Eleusis. It was a case of military conquest. See, it wasn't, people think that these, these barbarians who invaded the Roman Empire were not Christian. Most of them were. They had converted to Christianity long before they breached the frontiers of the empire. So Alaric was not necessarily just a looter who was uh, basically in the position of taking birth and killing anybody who was not Christian. So this is people or Yeah, he, he was just prosecuting a military campaign in the classical manner. So they were to be killed all the priests. Yes, he killed the priests, he tore down the walls, he leveled it, in other words. That's right, scorched earth. True, yeah. The appearance of these UFOs and people's interpretation and reaction to them. Um, it's like some some uh, force outside of humanity is trying to guide humanity. But now, how does that fit in with what you were describing earlier about this hermetic tradition and belief in which humanity is the brother of God and attempting it through, through its own inner forces a completion of its? No, well, this is a good. This is a good question. The way to draw. The way to steer the hermetic question toward the UFO question uh, is to look at, and I did want to look at this in the course of the day, this concept of the philosopher's stone. You see, alchemy arises out of hermeticism. Essentially, hermeticism is the philosophy that stands behind alchemy, which is the workbench activity of this magical system. The Philosopher's Stone is this, it's a concept of, of a universal medicine that cures all diseases, that confers immortality, that brings happiness 
and understanding. Uh, but it's more than that. It's everything you want it to be. And uh, the flying saucer is this same idea. The flying saucer, you, if, any, if you're really interested in this, the best book ever written on flying saucers, or one of the best, was written just a couple of years after the first flying saucers were seen. It's by Carl Jung, and it's called Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the sky. And he talks there about how the human mind uh, has an appetite for what are called totality symbols. The human mind is always trying to complete itself, fix itself in some way. And mandalas and certain kinds of symbols have the quality of indicating that this completion is underway. The, in the 15th and 16th century, before the rise of modern science, people didn't know what matter really was. They didn't really know what was possible with matter. So they would, you know, get um, glass flasks and combine horse manure and blood and all these things, and they would cook it for weeks and weeks, and they would observe color changes, and they did not have the kind of very fixed notion of the separation between mind and matter that we have because we have been trained to see mind and matter as tremendously separate categories. So these alchemists, working often day, or night, day and night in remote areas, on, you know, bad food and ergot-infested bread and what have you. Anyway, eventually they began to enter into a kind of waking hallucination with their alchemical activity. And so what you have in these glass retorts, presumably, are swirling chemical mixes. But the alchemist looking at these things didn't clearly distinguish between what is going on in the alembic, the alchemical vessel, and what was going on in their own imagination. The two categories weren't separate. So Jung noticed that these descriptions of chemical procedures that about alchemy are not to be taken seriously as real recipes. They are uh, descriptions of psychic processes leading toward individuation. Well, in a sense, um, the flying saucer is nothing more than a modern rebirth of the philosopher's stone. I mean, the flying saucer is the universal panacea at the end of time. It's the thing which cannot exist, but which does exist, and which, if we could obtain it, everything would be different. You see, we've swapped out elementals for aliens. Uh, and we've swapped out the Philosopher's Stone for the Flying Saucer. Nevertheless, if we were to attain the Flying Saucer, it would be the equivalent of the 16th century people obtaining um, the, the Philosopher's Stone. It, we are so bound in to the concept of the fixity of matter and its separateness from us as a mental category that we really rarely exercise our imagination in the way that, um, that these early people uh, did. For us, everything stands still. I mean, it's a mental exercise you should do for yourself sometime is... Uh, Imagine that you had uh, a material that could do anything. This is what the Philosopher's Stone is. It's a material object and it can do anything. Well, what do I mean by anything? Well, if you needed to go somewhere, you could take this material and stretch it out and then sit on it and it would fly. If you were hungry, you could eat it 
If you needed to take a shower, you could stretch it a certain way and hold it above your head and water would pour out of it. If you needed a piece of information, you could just address it and ask, like a visual telephone. See, we, we have created the Philosopher's Stone in the diffuse form of technology. We can do everything I just described, fly, talk to people at great distances, uh, eat synthetic food and so on, but we have solved each problem separately. Now, in a way, the computer is an interesting leap toward the Philosopher's Stone because if you analyze what a computer is, is it's a machine which can do anything. You have to tell it what you want it to be. If you want it to balance your checking account, it can do that. If you want it to predict the weather, it can do that. If you want to play a game with it, it can do that. It's mind-boggling to realize that anything you can conceive of, the computer can simulate. The computer is the first in a long line, extending into the future from this point in time, of, of omnipurpose machines. We're going to move into a world where you don't have a telephone to call your friend, a fork to spear your meat, and a comb to tease your locks. You have one thing, and this one thing does whatever you need to have done. Technology is beginning to compress, and it will, of course, be a kind of computer, but it will be uh, voice programmable to do anything. Well, this is a very hermetic ideal, and uh, we are migrating toward this kind of a, a fusion of possibilities. This is the secret of how to dematerialize culture. Make machines which can do more than one thing. Make machines which can do thousands of things, but always return to being a, you know, a little ball or a little box or something. Yeah. Yes, well, Newton is an interesting figure because, you know, Newton is the great father of modern science and he created, he was the one who figured out that you could use the calculus, that the calculus was not only figured it out, but developed it, that the calculus was a tool for solving a kind of multivariable problem that up until the invention of the calculus nobody had a clue. And modern science runs almost entirely on the, on the calculus and the various techniques that have been derived out of it, like partial differential equations and that kind of thing. But you're right, Newton himself was, was a man with a foot in two worlds. He was a thoroughgoing occultist. His alchemical experiments and notebooks were voluminous, and uh, and yet he was the founder of the royal, one of the founding members of the Royal Society, and it was the Royal Society was really the first think tank. It was a very modern institution, and uh, and, and so in the character of Newton, we see uh, the. Uh, you know the the magical mentality and the and the modern mentality welded into one individual. Uh, there are other cases like this. Uh, off and on over my lifetime, I'm working on a play about um, Michael Meyer, who was a great alchemist, and. Uh, uh, it's a complicated story, but I'll just give you a little bit of it. Anyway, Michael Meyer was the greatest alchemist of his age, and he was implicated in the Rosicrucian Enlightenment and so forth and so on. And there were a group of people around Frederick the Elector Palatine of Bohemia who wanted to establish a Protestant alchemical kingdom in Europe uh, in the early 17th century, around 1619. And uh, Meyer was part of this group. Well, 
they contrive to get this guy, Frederick the Elector Palatine of, of uh, uh, Bohemia, named emperor because at that time the princes of the Hanseatic League chose the emperor and they were actually able to do this but then when word got back to the Habsburgs in Spain they raised an army and destroyed this alchemical revolution. It's, if you're interested it, read Francis Yates' book The Rosicrucian Enlightenment but anyway uh, this Habsburg army, which laid siege to Prague in the summer of 1619 and then uh, destroyed this alchemical possibility, there was in that army a young, a 21-year-old soldier who was basically soldiering and wenching his way across Europe, which was something gentlemen did in those days. And uh, his name was René Descartes. And uh, after the fall of Prague, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was in early August of 1619, this Habsburg army was retreating across southern Germany, uh, returning to Spain, and they pitched their tents at Ulm in southern Germany, which strangely enough, keep your eye on those coincidences, folks, would be the birthplace of Einstein some centuries later. But anyway, they pitched their tents at Ulm, and Descartes, who was not the mature philosopher of science that we know, but just a, some punk mercenary, you know, getting his first taste of life, uh, that night he had a dream. And, the, and in the dream, an angel appeared to him. And the angel said, the conquest of nature is to be achieved through measurement and number. And Descartes awoke from this dream and he founded scientific materialism. He founded modern science based on the revelation of an angel. That's the point. Science was founded by an angel. It's no different from Mormonism, for crying out loud. It, 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 and, you know, they posture and preen about the glory of the rational intellect and all this malarkey. It's malarkey. If, if Descartes had not been given the clue by this angelic visitor, probably modern science uh, would have been delayed for another century or so. Well, you know, they don't talk about that. They don't even want to hear about it. And there are many instances in the history of science where these kinds of things have gone on. The, the, over, the overarching theme here, the thing which it serves to connect all this together, I think, is we've been talking today about alchemy and hermeticism, which is a fairly dry, you know, it's an episode in Western history, uh, a proto-scientific movement. And yesterday we were talking about how time is moving inevitably toward the production of some kind of uh, transcendent object or the coming into awareness of a, of a kind of transcendent object. Well, the connection between these two notions is the idea that history itself is a kind of alchemical process. You see, the idea that lies behind alchemy is that the alchemist can somehow step in as nature's helper and, and cause natural processes to occur very quickly because the belief in medieval Europe concerning, for instance, precious metals and stuff like that was that these things actually grew in the earth. And in a sense, they do. I mean, they accrete very, very slowly over time. So the idea that lies behind alchemy is the idea that if you could speed time up, then the processes which require millions of years in the earth could perhaps be achieved in years or months 
if you knew how to speed up time. Well, the goal of alchemy was the production of the philosopher's stone, this transcendental material, the universal panacea. What I've been saying here in all these lectures is that the goal of human history is the same thing. Therefore, human history is an alchemical process of some sort. Human history is the story of the descent of spirit into matter or the ascent of matter into the domain of spirit. It's something like that. And the speeding up quality of it, that's what we bring to it. History is the catalyst of nature, which is interesting because do you see in this metaphor it casts us in the role of those little elemental types. In the great alchemy of the redemption of the world, we are the elementals. And we are causing a process to take place which will accelerate the emergence of uh, the end state before it might ordinarily have happened. So the idea is that history itself is an invoking and a moving toward a fusion with this uh, alchemical mystery, which is then a coincidencia positorum. It means that the words used to describe the alchemical goal can be used to describe the historical goal. So the historical goal is then uh, legitimately describable as coincidencia positorum, union of opposites, uh, universal panacea, uh, the diamond body. All of these alchemical metaphors of completion are metaphors which, if we would but awaken to the spiritual dynamics of history, we could enunciate these things as a goal. I mean, imagine if the stated goal of, his, of, of global society were to produce a universal panacea. That means peace of mind for everybody, health and happiness for everybody. You see, it's weird. <clears throat> Millenarian or eschatological thinking has remained with us even though ideological uh, styles have changed. Marxism is a thoroughgoing millenarian cult. I mean, the withering away of the state is no less metaphysical a concept than the universal panacea at the end of time, and I dare say a good deal less likely. Uh, so we may have, you know, transcended Christian eschatological dreams, but we still are infected with utopian aspirations. And secular utopianism has never been more strong. It's just that it's now couched basically in the terms of Christian Democrats or something like that. Uh, but if we could uh, raise to consciousness our alchemical heritage and our heritage in the, sh in the shamanism of the archaic, then we could actually see that the purpose of technology is to liberate, not to enslave. And somehow we've lost the thread. Technology is not being used to liberate. It's being used to enslave. It's asking the, the mushroom, you know, how to save the world and having it say every woman should have only one natural child because this would uh, immediately create a collapsing demographic. You see, if every woman had only one natural child, in 40 years the population of the earth would fall by 50% without wars, without ep epidemics, without displaced people. It would just happen quite naturally. Uh, a, a woman in Bangladesh, well, let's put it this way, a woman on the Upper East Side who has a child, that child will have a thousand times greater negative impact on the resources of the Earth 
than a woman born to a child in Bangladesh. Where do we preach population control? Bangladesh, of course. If you were to go to Bangladesh and meet a woman who told you that her life's ambition was to have a thousand children, you'd think you were in confronting a social criminal of some sort, some kind of complete sociopath. But in fact, a woman in Beverly Hills or on the Upper East Side who decides to have one child is in that category. Now, interestingly, if we want to change the world then, we need to reach those women. And interestingly, they are the women that one would be most likely to reach. They're college educated, they're socially concerned, they're aware of the concept of political correctness, so forth and so on. They should be easy to convince. And you don't have to have 100% conviction. If you get 15% compliance, there would probably be an immediate easing on the pressure on resources and so forth and so on. Another interesting thing about this possibility is that it requires remarkably little input from men. It's the first plan for saving the world that I've ever encountered that isn't in the hands of white guys. You see? Uh, uh, now, people object to this by saying that uh, you don't understand numbers are power. A political power, ba a political power base is defined by numbers. But this can't be true. If that were true, China would be the most powerful nation in the world, with India second. So that isn't it. I I'm in awe of the mushroom's cleverness, because what this suggestion seems to imply is that we can serve ourselves and serve humanity without any kind of conflict. Because one could go to this hypothetical woman on the Upper East Side and say, how would you like to have a vastly expanded disposable income and a tremendously larger amount of leisure time and authentic status as a political hero at the forefront of the battle to save the planet? for crying out loud. You know, be richer, make your life easier, and be a hero. You can hardly miss. Now, why are we not hearing about this from any quarter of society? Because I think most people think, actually, that there are no solutions. They think we're just going to run this baby right over the edge of the cliff, and that'll be the end of it. Well, when you point out that something as simple, as voluntary, as limiting your uh, reproductive replacement to one child would chop the population of the earth in half in 50 years, people are stunned. You know, they never thought of that. Uh, these kinds of things uh, need to be considered. Now, when I ask myself, why aren't people embracing this? And this goes back to what I said before the break. I think they're not embracing it because... Uh, probably white guys, can't figure out how to make a buck in a situation of collapsing demographics like that. Capitalism wants, views us all as consumers, and it wants more consumers. The more consumers there are, the scarcer stuff will be. The scarcer stuff is, the more you can charge for it. The last barrels of petroleum will probably be sold for $50,000 a throw, uh, and the, another objection that people raise is they say, well, it's, a ter it's terrible to have uh, only one child. The child, you know, children need other children. Well, do you know what the present accommodation is? Most people have two children. Did you know that no society on earth has ever idealized the having of two children? It's a totally synthetic, artificial idea put in place by the Industrial Revolution so that for the convenience of uh, the managers of the industrial state. 
having two children. I have two children. It's a terrible idea. Do you know what happens if you have two children? They fight like cats and dogs. Uh, do you know how many children the average uh, family had in uh, 1800? Ten. So to think that by having two children you have somehow participated in a natural ages old family structure is just a bunch of malarkey. It's absolutely untrue. Well, if it's absolutely untrue, then let's go to one and save the earth. Uh, this is for those of you who don't think that the message of just sit back and watch it happen has any efficacy. Well, then if you really want to do something, no political act you would ever commit yourself to would have the, cons the positive consequences for suffering humanity that uh, deciding to limit your reproductive ability would have. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also... It's seen that the Earth is the only place that has the ability to have the ability to have the ability to have the well, now, this sounds like a plea for eugenics. Uh, is it a plea for eugenics? Well, I... Anyway, you, you, there's a logical error in your argument, you know, which is that you think that smart people have smart children. And genetically speaking, this is not necessarily true. I mean, there's a gene reshuffling that happens. Often, smart people attain their smartness through a kind of accumulation of recessive genes and the next generation will be peculiar in that family. You know, you don't want it, you can run it off the edge. Uh, see, uh, the thing I like about this suggestion from the mushroom is that it's non-coercive. We can think of many plans to save the world if they would just give us absolute power to order everybody around. But here's a plan where men really recede into the background. Now, women have always, in, within the context of modern feminism, have lamented their powerlessness to do anything about the male-dominated world. Here's something that they could do that would place them at the cutting edge of the reshaping of planetary civilization. And they don't have to get permission from anybody. So, w what about it? You know, it's there to be done. Yeah. I was wondering if we have the same genetics because then you came to Florida to see the scientific and racist background. But before you we were talking about possibility of genetic factors involved in the crime predisposition. And while if that proposal was coming from, say, you kids on the block, uh, I'd be very pleased with it. Coming to the panel audience, uh, I, I don't know if this is the place to, to convince people to, uh, uh, to extinguish their, their, their lives or whatever. Oh, you mean you think it's very important that we all breed as much as possible so that our superior types will invade society? Look, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to have freedom just because of the, 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 the mathematics of it. But those who can access the shamanic states, those who can communicate with the mind of Gaia, if anything is going to say the planet is going to come from, from, from this. This, this, this reservoir well, when I said that there were certain uh, genetic lines with a, tr a predisposition for shamanism, I didn't mean that some people can get high and some can't. I just mean some people are a cheap date and some people aren't. Uh, I really would resist the idea that 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 only some people can access these things. I think the great power of psychedelics is that they're democratic. You know, Tim Leary used to say, when in doubt, double the dose. <laughs> and that'll eradicate any of these genetic predisposition arguments uh, in a hurry. I, uh, it, it would be very, it, it would be a very interesting world where populations were dropping. You see, it's capitalism, I can't say this enough, is not in our interest. 
I mean, suppose we were to start, uh, women were to start only having one natural child. Very, very quickly, every time you went to your mailbox, you'd get a letter from a different attorney somewhere in the world telling you that a distant cousin you had forgotten about had just died and that you were his only surviving relative and you've just inherited more land, more houses, more cars, more investments. Uh, because if we're going to, if you chop the population of the world in half, you don't have to be Einstein to see that everybody generally is going to have twice as much uh, disposable uh, stuff here. Yeah, um, I, I have a couple of undigested uh, thoughts too that I'd like to see if kind of that direction is possible. And one, um, it, it seems generally that the total population, everything else for the other planet, it's possible that uh, Gaia has invented up over time thing, whatever it is that God is doing, what we've been doing, is developed. Uh, is, well, uh, having a human race that sort of uh, oh, God. You mean that we're the suicide species? Yeah, yeah, because, uh, let's say, um, it, well, it sounds like from what you're saying, that it would be a pretty good idea. To consider, and I would believe this all my life, you know, looking at uh, what human beings do to each other, not you know, kind of what, what we do to the earth. And, uh, I want to take a jump, I said this book is not well thought out, but the thing that interests me is the um, unmaterialized thought becoming material. Okay, it's happened. Maybe it had to happen because this is life and nothing is impossible to life. So it happened and then guys is okay enough and is somehow contributing with the well, but in that case, don't you think then that Gaia must be very alarmed that every day now in the Soviet Union, more and more thermonuclear weapons are being decommissioned? Absolutely, because, you know, as we hear, the, the volcanoes are, are increasing, especially on water. Uh, of Oregon, 20-some, were discovered. Well, the, yes, the, the Earth is perfectly capable of raising outrageous hell without us triggering a nuclear war. It doesn't even hurt, you know, that, that it must be a sort of displacement. Well, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, as I said, we don't know what we're for. Maybe we are a suicide machine. My, I, my faith is that we're just slow to get rolling and that once the battle is joined, once every person on Earth realizes that we're in a battle for planetary survival, then people will get with the program. It's just that things aren't bad enough yet. What about what you showed us yesterday, the graph showing the acceleration? Well, we don't know what lies beyond that omega point. Yeah, the next question I wanted to, yeah, I was hoping to sort of get back to that, but how do get here there? I mean, through all the thought forms, through all the stuff that we hear, you know, from, from moving and bringing and so on, and then, you know, what's happening. Well, there are all kinds of possibilities, you know. There, people are talking about nanotechnology. Do you all know what that is? That's this idea that all machines could be made so small that you can't see them. And uh, nanotechno And if you could make machines that small, it's conceivable that you could actually dematerialize human beings in some way. And we could all, you know, if we were all the size of a proton, we could store everybody in a grapefruit uh, buried on the back side of the moon. There are many different forms of escape. One of the puzzling things, we've talked a little bit about this um, asteroid strike that wiped out the dinosaurs. Well, the people who don't believe that it happened, their best argument is that the fossil record seems to show that there was a dying off of species right before the asteroid struck. 
over quite a long period of time, like over a million years or so, there was a dying going on, and then this asteroid struck. And I thought, wouldn't it be weird if what the solution to the 20th century's problems are is to establish a reservation 65 million years in the past, 25,000 years across, and everybody goes and lives there, and the whole thing is situated right in front of the asteroid impact so that no record of it survives, so that we are not confused by its existence. In other words, your grandchildren may live in a world that existed before you were born. Do you see how that could be? We could escape into time. We could escape into the quantum mechanical realms by becoming teeny the eensy beensy option. Uh, we could, uh, we could, maybe we're going to invent an engine, the equivalent of the spin dizzy in James Blish's novel Cities in Flight. Uh, if we, it could invent a spin dizzy engine, uh, we could build a starship and just leave the Earth. There are many, many possibilities. The pressure has not yet come on. I mean, we're led by jackasses. We don't bother with our political processes. But let the pressure come on, and I think people will make greater demands of their political institutions. And the pressure is going to come on. One thing I'm confident of is things are going to get worse before they get better. I find myself in the position of sort of cheering it on, because it is going to be a forward escape. There's no going backward. Things much, must get worse before they get better. I remember when Three Mile Island happened. I mean, I was, you know, melt down, <laughs> melt down. If this thing can vent a toxic cloud that makes Washington, D.C. uninhabitable, we'll get action. You want to see environmental consciousness move to the top of the agenda? Wipe out Washington, D.C. with a broken nuclear power plant and by God you'll see action. Well, yes, we mustn't get into these vindictive scenarios. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's generally credited if you read the people involved that really what turned things around in the Soviet Union was Chernobyl. It really was. In the minds of the leadership and the, the war fighting plans, and they said, for crying out loud, this thing wasn't even a bomb. It was just a power plant. And 11 days after it partially screwed up, we're able to re uh, measure increased radiation levels over Auckland, New Zealand. One power plant. What if there had been a thermal nuclear exchange, even a pissant exchange involving, say, under a hundred weapons? It's just, it's off the scale. So they looked at that and they said, we're bankrupt. We've had it. Then these were the male, dominator, the male dominators of the male dominators. I mean, if you've ever met members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, my God, you know, talk about people that it's hard to get a smile out of. <laughs> so, you know, what we have to do is stop looking for leadership from the top because the least among us make their way into those positions of power. I mean, you can see that now. Uh, the, those guys are not fit to throw guts down to a bear, any of them. And so, uh, you know, what we have to do is knock off this uh, fantasy of being citizens inside a democratic state. I mean, what we are are the propagandized masses inside a fascist dictatorship. And what people have to do is begin to form affinity groups, get their own ship together, get their own goals uh, defined, and then move out into it and do it. It's not going to come from, uh, you know, the policy council of the Republican or Democratic Party. That's just silly to think that. A lot of our projections or solutions seem to come from what we think now, but our situation is 
That's right, getting to know each other. Know your enemy, and they probably will not be your enemy. We have a very weird political agenda. I mean, you know, for instance, I don't want to get into an air-clawing rave about this, but I feel as a, as a person who was raised Catholic that I have a certain license to criticize my own subgroup. I think that, you know, the Third Reich was a Sunday school picnic in terms compared to the population policies of the Roman Catholic Church. They will shove millions of people per year into poverty, disease, and death in the, in, in the pursuit of a theological doctrine that nobody understands the sense of. Uh, in a civilized, uh, in a civilized uh, political environment, those people would be placed under immediate arrest, just like we did the leadership of the Nazis. I do not understand how you can call yourself pro-life when the policies that you espouse mean planetary death. That's the program of the pro-life position. More starvation, more agony, more wars, more destroyed land, more toxic output in the name of being pro-life? What kind of a... What have words come to mean? I mean, it's really bizarre. And we, even us, in this room, the thing that was so great about the 60s and that is so frustrating about the 90s is people do not get pissed off. I mean, you know, I can, I can tell you this and you can nod in agreement, but, you know, at some point the thing becomes so odious so clearly intellectually bankrupt, so clearly toxic to any kind of human values that any of us can relate to, that you just have to uh, put yourself on the line. And I don't know when that moment will come. It's not for me to say. I guess a switch will be turned in the unconscious. But there's enough evidence of outrage and... and uh, uh, muddle-headedness and outright evil around that sooner or later we're going to have to confront it. Otherwise, you know, this is a sinking submarine and, and uh, there is no way out unless people who really understand uh, the gravity of the situation and the stakes uh, make their voices heard. If we leave it up to the institutions that have been put in place over the last 500 years, these are anti-human institutions. These institutions hate the human race, hate ordinary people. And uh, until we wake up to this, we're going to be their victims. We're the marks. Well, how do you like being a mark? You can just take so much of that and then you just finally have to stand up and say enough, you know? And, uh, yeah, JP. I uh, mean, demographically, Japan comes close to what you talk about. They talk about a quiet revolution among Japanese women. But universally, the whole society views it as a disaster that the you know, demographic rate of increase is so low. And no one comes out and actually says this might be a good thing. It's due to the catastrophe that Japanese women are having so few children. It's interesting. I'll bet, though, that there are sectors in Japanese society that carry a small smile around on their face because they know then that while the rest of the world sinks into food riots, epidemics, and propaganda, that they will probably be able to ride it through. The genius of the Japanese is that they have been living in an environment requiring uh, careful resource management for centuries. They're masters of two things, resource management and long-term planning. We don't understand either. Our attitude is chop it down, move on. 
you know, see what tomorrow brings. Well, you know, there's a yawning grave waiting for people with those attitudes. Yeah. In the book, you offer some potential solutions to the problem. Uh, there's another problem that's captivated in public attention, and that's education. And implicitly, you seem to be an example of the opposite of what this culture cultivates in public education. I mean, here, oratory is alive and well, and awareness of history is alive and well. And I'm wondering, how, how did you choose to educate your own children, and how are, have your experiences, uh, what, what do they point towards as far as the kinds of educational reform that this society needs? Well, you're right. Education is the key. And, uh, you know, what I, it's just my opinion on this, but uh, history is, to not know your history is to be amnesic. I mean, if you met a person who couldn't tell you where they were from 1970 to 80, you would define them as a fairly damaged person. But how many people do you meet who can tell you where Western civilization was between 900 and 1600? People don't know. So since they don't know, they can be fed any shit that is out there and they don't know, they have no idea. So the way to gain power is to reclaim a command of history. And then you can, like for instance, I remember when uh, the Vietnam War was breaking out and I was in school at the University of California at Berkeley and and the professor said we all have to read um, Thucydides we all have to read uh, about the war against Sparta I'm not Sparta the war against Syracuse which was in Sicily and how it destroyed Greek democracy and how it allowed the ascendancy of the dictatorship of the 30. And why did this happen? Because the Athenian citizenry could not understand the war aims, because the Athenian leadership didn't understand clearly what the war aims were. All the mistakes of the Vietnam War were repeated in, or, or occurred in this war which was fought well before the year zero. But you tell most people to read Thucydides and they just give you a strange look. Well, it's not because we want to be obscurantists or we want to carry on conversations like Cambridge intellectuals. It's because we want to know what to do with the future. And the first thing you do with the future is you don't make the stupid mistakes that were made in the past. It, um, like this, this new age thing amazes me. I mean, there are people who call themselves spiritual thinkers who think that the spiritual quest began with Madame Blavatsky, for crying out loud. Well, I've got news for you. People have been over this ground again and again and again. It always amazes me that people will give their loyalty to a guru who is obviously, you know, a grab tailor and a tax skate and a jerk. And you say to them, well, you know, have you, have you read Plato? Or have you studied Nagarjuna? Do you know what Moses Maimonides has to say about this? Uh, and say, you know, why do you follow this guy? He probably hasn't even read these people. <laughs> do you know that there have been some fairly bright uh, people around over the last six or seven thousand years? And, and yeah, they don't have a white limousine or they won't invite you up to their place uh, in the Hamptons or something, but they're good. And all you have to do is go to the public library and read this stuff. And people don't want that. They want flash. Uh, this very sincere people come to my workshops and I realize that they want me to tell them this stuff. And because I guess this is better than sitting home on a Saturday afternoon and reading. But Plato said it a lot better than I'm saying it. And so did a lot of other people. The civilization is a vast storehouse of wisdom. But if you don't avail yourself of it, then you have to figure it out based on what's happened since Nixon or something. <laughs> and you're not going to get very far. You know, they trap you with that. The, I'm, I don't want to rave about this, but what I saw happen to my own university, I, I think 
that a conscious decision was made by the American establishment at the close of the 1960s. And what they said to themselves was, this idea of universal education and an educated citizenry, this we don't like. We see now the, what happens when you educate your citizens. They figure out the game. And they come to you with their plans for reform and how to make it better. So I was like among, at least at the University of California, I was among the last people to go through that university where the goal was to inform you about the nature of the of the enterprise called Western civilization. And after that, what they got into was this uh, MBA, data entry, uh, all this stuff. People, the, the universities became trade schools. And what they give you is video games. You know, they give you TV, video games, and they give you a skill. And you say, well, now you're a level three data enterer, uh, and you're gonna, we're going to give you $35,000 a year, and please shut up about it. That's it. You've been brought inside. But we're not interested in your opinions. We're giving you a life. We're giving you a trade. And we'll be giving you some orders downstream. And by God, you better snap too when the moment comes. This has nothing to do with democracy. This has this is fascism is what it is. Uh, yeah, every, everything is commoditized. Everything is uh, they assume that you and and you know, people these days want to be secure. I don't really understand that. It's great. You need a certain critical mass to give that up. It's great when you and all your friends agree that you don't care whether you starve or not because you're going to have so much fun doing it. But it's hard to reach that place by yourself because it's not very much fun. But, you know, it, it, it's... Um, there is a problem in that we are manipulated and we are not empowered and those who are empowered it wouldn't be so bad if they had a plan but their plan is you know another house another Mercedes a deeper swimming pool this is no plan uh, and so it's up to the creativity of ordinary people and the strongest weapon to support and augment the creativity of ordinary people is the psychedelic experience because it allows you to, to put information together in new and exciting ways. And this is to be then the basis of a new political order. It has to be. And if we don't react, then... Um, you know, the mushroom said to me once, it said, uh, if you don't have a plan, you become part of somebody else's plan. Because there are only planners and planees, you know. So what do you want to do? You want to be part of somebody else's plan or get your own agenda together? Yeah. How would you well, you stop lying about it for openers. I mean, I deal with this with my children, you know. I mean, we live in an area where half the population grows dope, and once a month they have anti-drug day at school, and it's just the level of cultural schizophrenia is just awesome, you know. So I just tell my kids the truth. And I say, here's, here's what it is. There are good drugs and bad drugs, but mostly it's the monkey doing the drugs. And, uh, you know, inform yourself. Ask me. If you don't believe me, you know all these other people, shrinks, chemists, avail yourself. Of, and I'm very pleased with, with how my kids are turning out. I mean, other people may look upon them with horror. I mean, <laughs> because they're... They don't take a lot of uh, crap from anybody, but they are of good heart and they trust themselves. Yeah. Sometimes I still take drugs to prove that. 
Well, no. The thing to do with the drugs on that level is let's unshackle psychotherapy and stop having it be this playpen game and actually get it into play. Psychotherapists are an incipient shaman class. I mean, obviously they aren't all, but that's the place to start. People who want to help people, people who have a, a portion of a medical education, and people who are interested in the dynamics of the mind. If we all came up through uh, a series of initiations where, you know, you were exposed first to this and then to that and then led on and always educated going in and always debriefed coming out, then these things would be, there would be no problem. We're just so weird about human nature. I mean, the sex thing has just been even mildly dealt with in the last 50 years. And we forget, you know, people didn't most, I don't know. I mean, it's just weird. People barely knew where children came from until the 20th century. I mean, sex was very, very chancy and iffy and occasional. And you read the biographies of the people who created Western civilization and they're mostly weirdos of some sort because they were bent by the sexual mores of the world they were living in. We have to, you know, the problem which haunted Marxism and which destroyed it ultimately was that they had the wrong version of what a human being is. They used to talk about what was called Marxist man. Well, Marxist man is such a limited concept of what people really are that it was it just it collapsed under its own weight on the other hand western man this concept is also a tremendously limited idea we deny our roots in the animal body we deny our roots in the life of the imagination Terrified of sex, you know, you have to do it in one position and it has to be a guy and a woman and it has to be within the confines of marriage and all this stuff. This is what was happening until very recently and still goes on, believe me, with enormous vehemence in a lot of places. Uh, and now drugs. I mean, drugs clearly are about human nature. And, and the model of human nature which this society has deified makes it a, a, a pathological act, a sin and a crime to alter your own consciousness. This doesn't make any sense. We are at war with ourselves and we're losing. Um, why, why then not call regular drugs? Well, because I think the word drug has been pretty thoroughly corrupted by the dominator. The way you corrupt a word is you, uh, you define it so broadly that it means nothing. And, you know, drug, we're talking about everything from DMT uh, through heroin and on to penicillin and aspirin. These are all drugs. So if we were, that's why I try to say psychedelics and, and insist, you know, that these are not drugs. There's something else, yeah. I also see in the books sometimes you've heard of intoxication, and I wonder if that's the sort of thing that I've people ask you to benevolent nature of your life. Yeah, you may be right. I, I've been in this business so long that the word intoxication doesn't have that connotation for me. but. One can never be too careful about the words one uses because they become realities. Uh, I'm not entirely happy with that book. I mean, and of course, once you write a book, then people come to you not only with criticisms but with suggestions, and you see how it could have been a much, much better book. But on the other hand, it was right for that moment, or it was as right as I could make it uh, for that moment. Yeah. Did you want to? Nope. Anybody? Yeah, back here. Uh, 
or taking DOE, taking SAT, pulling my hair back, wearing a suit, to stop me not allowing me to come in and make a change. So how can I do it from without when you suggest that I do go for a week and seven days or 20 years my mother would be able to express me any of that? And I have a very hard time with the old generation when people in their 20s come back in and express what they are all expecting here. Well, there's real, um, there's real youth phobia. Uh, youth is regarded as subversive. It's almost regarded as a standing army within society that belongs to a foreign power. Uh, the, the generational gap is not driven by the young. It's driven by the old who are nervous about giving up power. I mean, their attitude is, we can't trust you with the keys to the car. But the problem is they're driving the car over the cliff at 200 miles an hour. So I don't really have an answer for this. I mean, I am I feel very, very fortunate in that I have very rarely and only for brief periods of time ever had to take orders from anybody. Uh, now, in order to achieve that, I had to uh, do a number of things that prudence dictates I not even mention here. Uh, but I, it, you have to be very suspicious. You have to keep clear. They're always trying to get you down into the hole that they're in, you know. And, uh, yeah. Right. It's a myth. It's a myth. always talk about the future and the past, but if you will analyze it for a moment, there are many pasts. I mean, very few of us were probably in the same place last night, but we're all here now. So that means that many pasts lead into this nexus of the present. And three weeks from now, we pro very few of us will be together. I mean, some who came as couples, if they're lucky, will still be together. <laughs> but so there are many futures and there are many pasts. And the thing to do is to realize that you're not being born along on the current of some kind of inevitable thing where you're embedded in it like a raisin in bread. You're able to steer. You know, you're able to steer away from things that are bringing you down, and you're able to make alliances and relationships which, with things which support you. It's all about personal empowerment. And personal empowerment means deconditioning yourself from the values and the programs of the society, and putting your own values and programs in place. As long as you define yourself as a citizen, as long as you wait to be informed by NPR as to what the real nature of the world is, uh, you're not going, and I listen to NPR, I'm not, not, they're the best of the lot, the best of the lot, because the rest is such garbage you can't even get near it. But nevertheless, I notice on NPR an enormous amount of whining. What you have to do is realize that you are what I call, or, or that the thing to shoot for is what I call uh, extra environmentalism. You know how people someday, sometimes say, I feel like a person from outer space? 
that doesn't sound like such a bad way to feel. That means that you see what's going down. You see the game that's being run, and you don't buy in. You know, they can't buy you with a Mercedes or uh, uh, business trips to Paris or something like that. You're smarter than that. It's, it's a kind of controlled alienation, you know, where you actually cultivate extra environmentalism. The great thing about an extra environmental is that you're at home everywhere. Every place is your home. And uh, therefore you are always comfortable. And you don't have to be with people of your class or your color or your uh, earning capacity to be to feel all right. My, I think I said this at one point, but my namesake is the Roman poet Terence. And he wrote these really trashy little social commentary plays. But one quote of his has come down as fairly memorable. He said, I am a human being, therefore nothing human is alien to me, you see. And that's this thing where you, you accept the human, you become the extra environmental. But when, when you're with the Japanese, you're perfectly able to accommodate yourself to their values and styles. When you're with folks in Lawrence, Kansas, you can come up to that measure. And it, it's a kind of shifting, it's a magical thing. It's a shamanic thing. You're a performer. You always move through these things with a sense that this is not who I am, this is not what I am, this is merely a response to the demands of the moment. Yeah? Well, because these realities are that in that understanding. You know, like people say, one of the things I, I once said to the mushroom, uh, why me? Why are you telling me all this stuff? And it, without hesitation, it said, because you don't believe anything. You don't believe anything. Uh, belief makes it impossible to believe the opposite proposition. And that means you've just truncated your freedom. No matter how noble the belief you have taken on, you have just rejected and limited your ability to believe other things. My favorite story in the shows you how proud I am. My favorite story in the Gospels is the story of the Apostle Thomas, because you will recall that um, after the crucifixion. Uh, this is a good place to end. This is an alchemical story. After the crucifixion, uh, Christ appeared to the apostles in the upper room in Jerusalem 40 days after. And, uh, and Thomas was not there. I don't know where he was, somewhere. They'd sent him out for sandwiches or something. Anyway, he came back and they said, uh, the master was with us. And he said, come on you guys he said you've been smoking too much red lab we brought in three weeks ago and they said no no the master was with us and he said unless I put my hand into the wound I will not believe it so then time passed and then Christ came again to the apostles and uh Thomas was among them on this second get-go. And Christ walked in and kicked off his overshoes and looked around the room. And he said, Thomas, come forward. Put your hand into the wound. Which he did. Which he did. Now, people have different interpretations of this story. My interpretation of it, which is what I'm going to leave you with, is that alone among all human beings in all of human history only one person was ever so privileged as to be allowed to touch the resurrection body it was Thomas the doubter 
who was allowed to touch the resurrection body because he didn't believe. And so if you want to touch the resurrection body, be very careful with where you commit your belief. Keep your eyes open, stay smart, take it easy, 